Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the DC Animated Universe Retrospective, and it's hard to think we've gotten to this point. We're now on the final season of Batman the Animated Series, the fourth volume, aka The New Batman Adventures, or the abbreviation TNBA. You might be wondering why there's a fourth season and yet I decided to give a speech from the heart on my thoughts on BTAS as a whole in the last video. Well, that's because when it comes to both production and reception, this season is a bit of an outlier. There are several reasons as to why this is, we can get into as time goes on, but the reason I gave that speech then was because that was the end of the BTAS era as we knew it. Where BTAS was the only show in the DCAU and we only got light references to other DC Comics characters. This is a bit of a tangent, but bear with me. From my perspective, the DCAU can easily be split, in terms of air dates, into three eras. The BTAS era, which consists of BTAS, Phantasm, and Sub-Zero, TNBA is very much a part of what I'm dubbing the World's Finest and Beyond era, consisting of TNBA, STAS, and Batman Beyond, all released in the late 90s and ended in the very early 2000s, with the final era being the World's Greatest era, consisting of Zeta, Static Shock, and of course, Justice League slash Justice League Unlimited. Point being that by the time TNBA rolled around, the DCAU had changed. It's not just Batman and some other DC characters, we have a universe on our hands. This serves as a smooth segue into the history lesson. As was established previously, BTAS came off the air on Fox in the year 1995. It was of course a huge success from start to finish, but one year later, WB commissioned the same team to work on a Superman show. Not for Fox this time, but instead their own network, the WB. With BTAS already over, this gave the team a chance to start fresh, not just in the kinds of stories they were telling, but the most notable change came, the animation. Bruce Timm is a very unique art style. No matter what, you can tell when his designs are being used. But that isn't the change I'm referring to. STAS had simplified the designs of BTAS, which had a very detailed approach that was in no way cheap. I'm guessing this is why so many episodes had noticeable mistakes. The features of the characters were less rounded, and in general the lines of the cartoons were simpler and more visible. As a whole, STAS just looked a bit more cartoony than BTAS did. STAS started in 1996 with appearances from other DC characters and references to Batman himself, so it was very plausible that this version of the Man of Steel existed in the same universe as the Dark Knight we'd grown to know and love back in BTAS. I know this sounds like a massive STAS history lesson when the subject of today's video is TNBA, but the reason for that is that TNBA's history is very much tied to that of STAS, which is tied to the end of BTAS v3. I wanted to keep this retrospective smooth, hence why we've done and will continue covering all BTAS content before moving on to STAS and then JL and so on. To relate the history lesson back to TNBA though, in 1997 the decision was made to bring back BTAS for the WB and it would cross over with STAS, but for consistency's sake, and for money's sake, the same streamlining process done to STAS would need to be applied to BTAS as well, thus giving us the TNBA that we now know today. But they didn't just take what was done already and give it an STAS makeover. For TNBA, they took this chance to radically alter the designs of the characters, and that's a decision that's still met with controversy to this day. Because, you know, different and therefore ruined, right? Watch any video about TNBA specifically, and I guarantee you that a lot of time will be spent on the character designs and how good, meh, or bad they are. I'm just going to talk about the different character designs right now, at the very beginning of this review, because let me tell you, I really don't care about that at all. Like I said, in regards to STAS, Bruce Timm has a very unique art style, so it doesn't look so radically different as to not be worthwhile or not good. But to be fair, let's look at some of these designs. Batman himself has swapped costumes. Instead of a bright bat emblem with blue on the inside of the cape, we now have a giant black bat emblem and gray on the inside of the cape, with the belt going from one solid piece to individual pockets. It's kind of like his first costume that we saw in Phantasm Robin's Reckoning in The Mechanic, however that leads to the interesting question, is this suit canon? Like I just said, we know that Batman went from this suit to the BTAS one. The Justice League costume is also a variant of the TNBA suit, and we most certainly have no idea if that's canon or not. Take the episode Mad Love, for example. We get flashbacks that had to have taken place before BTAS started, but we have the TNBA designs. Probably is not to confuse the kids or something, but does that mean the flashback is just intentionally not accurate, or is the suit not canon? But just you wait, we will see just how unreliable a bat suit is in regards to determining timeline placement. That brings me to the next point. Batman may have gotten a costume change, however many of the villains have gotten complete physical makeovers. The Penguin in BTAS was meant to resemble Danny DeVito's portrayal of the character in Batman Returns, but the film series was done by this point, so now he just looks like a normal person. The Mad Hatter is a lot shorter than he was in BTAS, Poison Ivy has white skin, which you could probably make a pretty sad theory about considering the end of House and Garden, 
But the video is still young, so I'll put a pin in that for now. In general, the female villains look a lot younger. In BTAS, Catwoman and Ivy had looked like fully mature women. Maybe in their 30s, like Batman. But they look around 19 to 24 here. Uh, okay. I prefer it the old way, but I'm not losing sleep over this. Killer Croc has changed skin tones, Bane has a new mask, Freeze has a new suit color. See where I'm going with this? I have absolutely nothing to say about any of this because frankly, I really don't care. So much distaste in the offset for this season has come entirely because of this animation shift. Hello, aren't we telling stories here? It's not like we went from Mask of the Phantasm to Newgrounds animation. It is fine. But most of the hatred has gone to the Joker. People all across the internet have thrown their complaints in the face of this design and I really don't know what to tell you. He looks like the Joker to me. I prefer the red lips and the yellow eyes from BTAS, but I don't know, this is perfectly tolerable for me. It's still Mark Hamill voicing him and the same amazing writers writing for him with by far my favorite Joker episodes yet, so I'm not talking about this design any further. It's been done to death. I'll be honest with telling you that the only redesign I don't like, let alone hate, is the Riddler, which, oh my, he looks terrible. Looks like Jim Carrey's version in Batman Forever. Just a really bad design for someone who looked great back in BTAS. But luckily, the Riddler has no episodes dedicated to him this season, so we really don't have to talk about him that much. On the whole though, this is a hot take, but I vastly prefer the look of TNBA and STAS to BTAS. I know I just said that. But I'm not doing it from a position of being a contrarian. I'm saying this since I firmly believe this to be the truth. I think BTAS is a better art style, and by that I mean the look of the show on character design sheets and all that. Hence why Mask of the Phantasm has had the best animation yet. But we're talking about the shows here, and the final product I might add. BTAS had a lot of problems in the animation department. Issues that were sorted out as they went along, but issues nonetheless. Areas of the simplified art style didn't need to worry about as much. For one, the action in TNBA is far better than anything in BTAS. Season 3 of BTAS really stepped up to the plate in this category, but still, that had nothing on how fast-paced and snappy the action sequences are in TNBA. What better way to cap off a great episode than with a great action scene as Batman rips goons apart and gets in that oh-so-satisfying punch of the villain at the end? But I can highlight those as we go. Basically, take what I said about the action in the last video and multiply that by 10 and you have TNBA. But more importantly, my biggest reason for saying TNBA and STAS look better than BTAS can be summed up in one word. CONSISTENCY I really don't take too many points off from BTAS for this, but damn is it noticeable how inconsistent BTAS looks. Sure, each episode was done by a different company than the last, but still, no excuse for why Batman's Bat Emblem would be huge nothing to fear, but be really tiny in I Am The Knight. Or how Bruce's face will look like this in Shadow of the Bat and most episodes, but then there's I Am The Knight which just sticks out. Or look at Moon of the Wolf. In one shot, Dr. Milo's jacket will be one color, another in the next, and another in the shot after that! Things like that are laughably amateur and it negatively affects the presentation of the show. TNBA and STAS are simpler, yes, but it means that the companies working on these episodes had an easier time staying close to the sheets while working with the deadlines. In addition to that, it just makes a more enjoyable watch for me when everything will look the same and be consistent between episodes. I am not saying there are no mistakes. This is the DCAU, of course there are animation mistakes, but between episodes, the Batsuit won't have massive incongruities or Bruce changing facial shape ever so slightly. Also, the insanity that the number of times he goes in between having white eyes or skin colored eyes has also been remedied since all of Bruce Wayne's appearances in TNBA, STAS, JL, and Batman Beyond are all colored. So yeah, I could go on, but like I said, the animation topic really isn't my specialty, and I believe I've gotten my point across. The animation this season is great and the character designs are really not that big of a deal. Calm down. From this point forward, I'll highlight good action scenes, but beyond that, this is about characters and storylines, and there's a lot of ground to cover amongst these 24 episodes, which might not be as many as the last three seasons, but like I said, there's a lot to say. Before getting started, it's important to mention that when going into this season, I remember it clearly being my least favorite season of the show, much like everyone else. I praised the ever-living daylights out of season 3 as being the best of the show, so upon this revisit, will TNBA claim the title for the best season of BTAS? Let us find out by starting with none other than the very first episode. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Holiday Nights. So, I don't mean to endlessly repeat myself, but I believe that the first episode of these seasons should be a trendsetter, if it needs one. On Leather Wings being our introduction to the show's format, Eternal Youth told us to expect more of the same thing as Season 1 with a higher budget, Shadow of the Bat sets up Season 3 as having more story, 
So, how about Holiday Nights? Well, are any of you familiar with the Brave and the Bold comics from way back when? Or hell, Batman the Brave and the Bold from the late 2000s? The idea was to see team-ups of all different kinds from different heroes each time. This season does something very similar. We can of course get into this as the video goes along, since the start of this season does indeed have quite a bit of mystery when going into it. Since Robin is now years younger, Batgirl seems to be a full-time member as opposed to the occasional assistance that she offered before, with this mysterious Nightwing character being here as well. Like I said, there's plenty of time for that later. Point is, this season will give us various mix-ups between these four characters. It could be just Batman, or Batman and Robin, Batman and Batgirl, Batman, Robin and Batgirl, Batman and Nightwing, and so on. Holiday Nights focuses on three different storylines, one after another that are all about different things and characters, all with the holiday theme in the background. Oh, and just a side note, the title cards from BTAS are now gone, and in their place we have text that says the episode's name. I'm fine with either to be honest, so as I was saying. The first plot is a scheme by Harley and Ivy to have a fun holiday shopping spree. To make this plan work, they need Bruce Wayne, and he's at yet another one of Veronica Vreeland's parties. At this rate, she must have one of these like every other day. And she also switched her hair color back to red, since it was blonde in Sub-Zero. Just in case you forgot. I know I already did. These three plots are simple, so let's get into it. Ivy uses her manipulative stuff to make Bruce Wayne take them on a shopping spree using his credit card. The resulting montage being quite entertaining with Bruce signing his name, although his resilience is quite impressive. As we all know, Bruce is no normal man as shown by the fact that the driver that they got is a complete vegetable thanks to Ivy, but Bruce is strong enough to be conscious of the fact that he's doing something against his will. Whoa! Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god! We... we killed him! Oh well. We were going to do it anyway. We got his credit cards, what's to worry? With Bruce now assumed dead, it's time for the Batman to take over, which isn't as easy as it may seem. Get used to this, but Batman takes quite the beating this season with the scenes I'll talk about as we go. But I'll say now, I like that fact. Makes the victory at the end feel more grand. We also get introduced to the new tech that Bruce is using. Like the new Batmobile, for example, that's a much sleeker design. Or the new grappling hook, which also has a much sleeker design, and with much less noise and being fired in comparison to BTAS. Batman pulls the Christmas tree down and it lands on Harley and Ivy, thus ending the first of the three stories. Well, here's your stupid tree. You happy? Yeah. <clears throat> the next one opens up a few days later, with Barbara Gordon shopping for a gift for her father, with Harvey Bullock as the mall Santa. Oh my goodness, I'm already in love. You know, you could be a little more jolly, St. Nick. Give me a break, Montoya. This is the lamest stakeout I've ever been on. Bullock and Montoya are on lookout for a mystery group of shoplifters, and these kids become one to reveal... Clayface. If you remember, Clayface had died in the water back in Mudslide from Season 2, and now he's back. Well, this contributes to the mystery of Season 4, like I said. We'll learn more about this in a few episodes. Short story short, Barbara changes into Batgirl and attacks Clayface with her getting the people out as she gives Bullock and Montoya an edge in the battle, thus ending the second story. Not so fast, Santa. We still have to recover the evidence. Oh no. Oh yes. Roll up those sleeves. Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> Anyway, the third, final, and best story of the bunch takes place on New Year's Eve. Snapped, Altieri fades back, looking for an opening. <whistles> Hi-ho, couch potatoes. I'm interrupting the toilet bowl to bring you my very special New Year's resolution. <clears throat> Starting tonight at midnight, I, your loving Uncle Joker, do solemnly vow not to kill anyone for a whole year. Which means I'm going to have to work extra fast to bump off a few more of you today. <laughs> Hysterical. This is our introduction to the new Robin, who, like I said before, is much younger, and you can see that in his fighting style. Since he can't just punch guys directly, he has to be a bit more defensive and use his size to his advantage, which is a subtle detail that I like. How about that Joker TV appearance, though? There are a few interesting things to note. One, I'm keeping track of all the times that he invades the airwaves, so add Holiday Nights to the list. And two, 
The TV is in color, which again shows the passage of time since in the last three seasons, every time a TV was involved, it was always black and white. 3. It was very noteworthy how the Joker just vows not to kill anyone for the year. This will be a factor for the remainder of the retrospective, but once again, we are not on Fox anymore, this is Kids WB. The censors have different standards and so the writers are able to do a lot more. In BTAS, we rarely ever saw blood, and the only example I can think of being On Leather Wings, the very first episode, and we especially never saw people actually being hit by the bullets that were flying. Here, we will see those elements far more often, as well as some shocking moments during STAS, Justice League, and Batman Beyond. This trend starts right now with this scene. I was really surprised when I saw the Joker just nonchalantly pull out a handgun and shoot Batman with it. And our story comes to a close with the Joker having the bell from New Year's come crashing down upon him. Ending the story with a great scene as Batman and Gordon share a cup of New Year's coffee with Batman footing the bill as usual. So that was Holiday Nights, and I must say, my mind was certainly not blown by this episode since all three of these plots are really basic, but the animation, character interactions, and variety makes it stand out as my favorite intro BTAS episode of all time. This is an episode based on the issue of the Batman Adventures, which I haven't mentioned yet, come to think of it. If you don't know, those are the tie-in comics for the DCAU shows, a lot of which is canon, some isn't, and some were adapted into episodes this season. An example being Holiday Nights, like I just said, but the other, perhaps more famous example being Mad Love. The iconic episode we'll most certainly be discussing later down the line. The Watchtower Database is a full trivia video about the issue this episode is based on and what was changed, so go watch that. Without further ado, we still don't know who this new Robin is and where he came from, so let us move right along to the answer that is revealed in Episode 2, Sins of the Father. The episode opens with a kid named Tim Drake on the run from a cop he just stole the donuts from as he makes a getaway showing his existing agility and ability to think on the fly. He makes use of a batarang to get away from the cop, which is interesting. Again, the mystery is finding out who this kid is and why he became Robin. It's hard to say that this is an origin story right off the bat since he's seen using a batarang. After the fact, we can tell he probably just found this somewhere, but it's interesting nonetheless. Following that, we get a look at Drake's household, which is a complete pigsty. These goons are looking for Drake's father, but he isn't around, a setup all too familiar to this version of Batman. This results in a quick chase scene between the goons and Tim, where we learn that the goons work for Two-Face. Evidently, Drake's father stole something crucial from Two-Face while working for him and has since skipped town altogether, leaving Tim behind. He stole something from me. Your charming good looks? This doesn't stop Two-Face from getting what he wants, though. I like the fearless attitude of Tim Drake here, it makes him a character you can easily root for. Thankfully, Batman arrives to stop this with a pretty good fight scene as Batman takes yet another hard hit. <laughs> Batman has no choice but to bring the kid back to the Batcave with him, where unfortunately Tim makes his way upstairs where he finds out that Bruce Wayne is Batman as Batgirl arrives to stop him. Now, thanks to the note that Tim's father left behind, Batman and Batgirl know that Two-Face needs some chemicals from the airport. And that's where they go next, the brief action scene as Batman is clearly weaker than usual thanks to the injury from earlier. Once again, this is what I love in this version of Batman. Weaker versions show him getting beat for contrived reasons, but here he might get hurt from a large hit or maybe his own poor judgment and so on. I don't know why, but I've always gotten the biggest kick out of seeing Two-Face just quickly and effortlessly sending this worker from the car down to the ground in one hit. Two-Face gets away with the chemicals as he makes a threat to the city to give him money or else he'll kill everyone with the chemicals. Although, at this point, just how easy is it to take over the airwaves in Gotham? Eventually, we'll be told just how they get airspace, but still, I wonder how much these notorious supervillains have to pay for airtime. Batman and Batgirl discover who Drake's father was, and I just had to laugh out loud when I saw the picture of his father as a kid. That is literally Tim Drake right now with bags under his eyes. I mean, hey, if they were Ghostbot, they'd just give him a mustache and a top hat, but that's neither here nor there. Despite that, this is a pretty sad scene as they find out that Drake's father has moved to another city with a different name. That means he's not coming back. My old man. He's gone for good. That's what a John Doe means, right? Well, we can't be absolutely... Yes. He was never gonna come back for me anyway. Oh, also, if it didn't stand out to you, I'll highlight it. 
When Tim gets upset about his father being gone for good, Batgirl tries to console him, but Batman just unemotionally drops the hard truth. This will become a core part of my analysis towards Batman's personality, but for right now, look at Bruce's reaction to Dick and Robin's reckoning and you'll see the difference. Does the hurt ever go away? I wish I could say yes. But it will get better in time. For you. That I promise. Something has changed here, and that is another mystery to be resolved as we go deeper into the season. The episode is almost done, but we do have a brief action scene as Batman and Batgirl try to disrupt Two-Face's plans, and it's at this time that Tim has had enough sitting around and dons Dick Grayson's original Robin suit from when he was a kid and becomes the new Robin. With this being Tim Drake's official introduction as Robin into this season, and he is very different from the Robin we've seen in previous seasons. Dick Grayson was in college by the time of BTAS, so he was far more experienced and knowledgeable. As a result, he could question Batman with more ease since he had greater understanding of the world around him. However, Drake is just a kid, so he's going to have to grow his skills throughout the season, but he does it all with such enthusiasm that you root for him all the way. Oops. Ending the episode with Tim being officially trained by Bruce with a surprise visitor at the end. I make the rules. Watch out for that last one, kid. It's a killer. Dick. My word. Hey, no one can be a boy wonder forever. And I must say, that was a fantastic episode! Not only does it do a good job filling in the blanks in regards to Tim's backstory, but it also is an interesting story that kept me engaged throughout the whole thing. Good action scenes and it sets Tim Drake up as a relatable character. It also deserves points since we already got a Robin origin story episode for Dick Grayson back in the above mentioned Robin's Reckoning. While comparing these two episodes, I showed a change in Bruce's personality with another great example of that being the training scene. Bruce was having actual fun with it back in the day. See? It's finesse, not strength. Finesse, huh? Hey! Okay, now you're gonna get it. <laughs> Whoa! Too slow, huh? <laughs> but here, he was pretty cold throughout. You work with me, Tim. You follow the rules. Rule number one, <laughs> you give me everything you've got. Rule number two, <laughs> then you give me more. And rule number three, <laughs> I make the rules. We saw how Dick was brought up from a good family which had an effect on his personality and thus making us buy his heroic attitude. Tim Drake had a pretty rotten life before meeting Batman and thus it's thanks to Batman that his life is put on track. Since we saw Tim steal a box of donuts from the cop, that also contrasts with Dick since like I said, he had good values which made him want to help people both in and out of the costume. Whereas Tim Drake is more in it for the adventure. Having said that, that covers Sins of the Father. A great episode that sets a high bar for the season. So, moving right along to Cold Comfort. I have made jokes about it before, but this episode, as the title may have suggested, is a follow-up to Sub-Zero, the movie that I covered last time. And this is the fourth part of the Freeze saga, with only one part remaining that we'll get into way later down the line. Freeze had a pretty conclusive ending in Sub-Zero, so I'm pretty interested in seeing where they take it here. Beginning with a TV interview with this leading scientist which marks the debut of the reporter, Jack Ryder. Every series has at least one reporter that frequently appears, like Summer Gleason in BTAS and of course Lois Lane in STAS. Jack Ryder filling the role for TNBA, but be sure to keep him in mind for his spotlight appearance in episode 23. After busting in, Freeze wrecks this woman's dinosaur, followed by a scene between Bruce and Gordon that must be discussed. In previous videos I mentioned that Kevin Conroy, the voice of Batman's performance, had changed this season. I don't really know how to describe it, but in TNBA and onwards, he just sounds normal, like he isn't putting out a voice. Whereas he definitely did as Bruce in BTAS, with Wayne sounding really goofy and out of touch when interacting with friends and such. This created a believable distinction between Bruce and Batman. Bruce now also has the same voice as Batman, which had me worried since I was unsure of how blurred the lines would be between the two since I haven't seen this season since 2014 prior to making the video. With that tangent done, the point I'm trying to make is that Bruce is telling Gordon about the crime with the dinosaur and the following happens. And there it was, right on my TV, Mr. Freeze and that lizard. Dinosaur. Whatever. Doesn't make any sense. It's something really small, but it really stands out as Bruce plays dumb here. The same thing happens way later in the season in the episode Critters. Quick thinking, Wayne. Actually, I was trying to escape through the window. 
because of these examples, I'm definitely sure this was an intentional detail. Now I can say I like both sides of Bruce's public persona that we have in the DCAU, but I actually do prefer the idea that Bruce just acts dumb since that's what people think of him in the public. It makes for a more believable cover. Which once again proves my idea that the Christopher Nolan Batman and the Bruce Tim Batman, that's this one by the way, are very comparable. Anyway, Freeze raids this party, ruining the painter's passion project. Batman, of course, arrives on the scene to fight with Freeze and... Oh my god! You saw that, right? Batman just hit this hench girl's Freeze gun so she would get shot by it as Freeze makes his escape. If you remember, the exact same thing happened in Heart of Ice where Freeze shot one of his own henchmen by accident and left him behind. With Batman forgetting about Freeze and bringing the poor guy back to the Batcave to save his life before the hypothermia kicks in. Not only did Batman cause this woman to have a frozen leg, but he immediately chased after Freeze! Now I'm sure Gordon can take care of her, but Batman doesn't even give a second thought. I'm not complaining mind you, I'm simply observing. I find this scene to be fascinating, and trust me, I am going somewhere with this. Since Robin's out of the loop in regards to Freeze, Batman and Batgirl give him the rundown of the Freeze story, including the fact that Freeze, following the events of Sub-Zero, had never gone to see his wife. In case you forgot, Batman managed to rescue Nora but failed to save Freeze, and as Bruce, he used his resources to save Nora since Bruce is the true man of the people, unlike Ferris Boyle, the man that Victor did go to prior to Heart of Ice. After a long wait, Nora married her doctor and moved from Gotham, which is a real heartbreaker if I've ever seen one, since Freeze has done nothing but try to find a cure for her. But this is the outcome. Sure, he never did the most legal things, but still. The love he had for Nora was unmatched. I'm curious to find out why this is, since I had written in my notes to mention this fact as a flaw, but the episode is still young. Let's give it some time. Freeze is then seen being worked on by the scientist that he's holding hostage, to which he then decides his next target. As my father once told me, those who have the most, must give the most. Those who have the most, also have the most to lose, Mr. Wayne. I don't really know why he's going after Wayne, since again, the ending of Sub-Zero showed that Freeze knew that Bruce, and by extension Batman, had saved Nora. I'm not taking off points just yet, but I am intrigued. The next scene adds to Tim's character quite a bit, since it again separates him from Dick Grayson as a kid. The subject matter being schoolwork. To be fair, we saw Grayson in college, and not whatever Gray Drake is in, but we saw the attitude of Grayson as a kid, and I'm going to guess that he wasn't like this. You don't know the first thing about the American justice system, do you? I know it's bogus. And how did you come to that well-thought-out conclusion? Watching you. You don't exactly follow the rules of due process. I... How did you do on your math test? Now that Freeze has raided Wayne Manor, we get a brief, albeit not very interesting, fight scene between Freeze, his crew, against Bruce, Tim, and Batgirl, with the added stakes of having Alfred be a casualty of the battle. But luckily, he's gonna be okay with Tim being left in charge as Batman and Batgirl track down Freeze. I guess Batman always keeps a handy pair of explosives to open locked doors with. Hey, Freeze, look who dropped in. I was hoping to see you again. And what the? The decision to make Freeze a robot has been met with some really huge backlash. Going into this episode, I agreed with that. However, having seen it again, I can't say this was a bad thing. Freeze's story has always been tragic, that's the point, with a bittersweet ending in both Heart of Ice and Deep Freeze. Sub-Zero gave Freeze a semi-happy ending, but the problem was how Freeze didn't contribute much to that happy ending, and there wasn't a single lesson learned by any character, hence why that movie is as weak as it is. I think this episode takes that happy ending and gives it a tragic twist. Freeze, now happy his wife is finally safe, is starting to have a deteriorating body, and by the time he got these doctors, it was just too late for him. This was before Nora was fully revived, I might add, so he would have returned to her a robot. Now that she's moved on, his whole plan is just to take the happiness away from everyone else who dedicated their lives to a cause like him. Now the plan is to freeze over the whole city. A bit cliche, but what else does he have to do at this point other than take everyone with him? The result is a pretty bloody battle between Batman and Freeze, literally since we see blood, once again a product of the lesson censors, and then the episode ends in a similar vein to The Dark Knight Rises as Batman gets the ship into the water and drops the bomb in it alongside Freeze, which is a sad ending for the man, but like I said, 
There's still one episode left for Freeze and Batman Beyond's Meltdown. And that was Cold Comfort, yeah, another top-notch episode. There isn't too much to say about it overall, though. I enjoyed the action, the storytelling, and Freeze is still one of my favorite BTAS villains. So, without further ado, let us move on. Double Talk. In the last season, we were introduced to Scarface and the ventriloquist Arnold Wesker. And now it's his turn to get the Redemption Gone Wrong storyline that I discussed in depth last time. Only with a twist at the end that I'll get into later. Arnold has been declared sane and Bruce Wayne gets him a job at his company, but now the crew that worked for Scarface wants to get the gang back together, resulting in a great fight scene between Batman and the Rhino, with the hilarious detail that the other guy keeps trying to get Batman from behind. Wesker's off limits. Got it? As the story goes on, Wesker keeps getting strange mail and phone calls from someone who sounds like Scarface, with Batman giving chase to this strange, fake Scarface. Which should be a red flag to anyone since we all know that Scarface can't operate without Wesker, and if he could, he wouldn't need him. So something is up. Unfortunately, Wesker rejoins the gang, but I must say, the scene with Batman moving about in this hallway looks absolutely horrendous. Like someone just took the walk cycle and dragged it across the screen in Vegas. Or Movie Maker, whatever the hell they used. Anyway, Batman and Batgirl get a lead on the heist Scarface and company are going to be pulling, this being Wayne Tower, with a brief scene of Batman and Batgirl trying to escape the money vault before it explodes, leading to the climax as Scarface tries to kill his own men for going after Wesker too early. Batgirl comes to their rescue with Batman asking Wesker to finally do the right thing. He's the puppet, not you. Don't listen to him, dummy! He's playing you like a cheap fiddle! Do him already! I'm sorry. Come on, what are you waiting for? For once in your life, do something right. Yes. That's it, dummy. When I get my hands on... Ending the episode with Wesker at peace, with Bruce even giving him his job back. Very surprising for this season's Bruce, if I do say so myself. But the best part is how Wesker's life is on the right track. This is the inverse of how the season 3 stories worked. There, the villain was pulled back to crime and stayed that way. But Wesker didn't want to come back, and once he overcomes Scarface, he doesn't. This is also his final appearance. In this dimension, anyway. And that was Double Talk, a great, albeit smaller story. But after two big episodes, I'm glad we got a smaller story to take a deep breath. Since now we have two big episodes coming up, starting with episode 5, You Scratch My Back. So the mystery of Robin was resolved just a few episodes ago in Sins of the Father, and at the end, Dick Grayson returned with the line, Nobody can be a boy wonder forever. A funny line to end an episode on, but the characters all look surprised to see him. So clearly he's been gone a long time. Now he's in Gotham with his new persona, Nightwing. There are a few other details to pick up on though. What are you doing here? Pre-dawn, the dockyards. Where else would a person in a mask be? This is my gig. If I needed you, I'd have called. Nightwing is really annoyed here with the presence of Batman and Batgirl. As you may remember, Dick and Barbara were dating in Season 3 and Sub-Zero, but now the dynamic is far more antagonistic. So this clues you into the fact that something happened that turned the BTAS setup we all know and love on its head. We just need to keep watching the season in order to find out what the answer to that is. In combat, Dick Grayson as Robin was basically just like Batman, with the difference being that Batman was obviously stronger and better at it than Robin, but he can still hold his own in many instances. This scene is Dick's debut as Nightwing, so let us just see how much he's learned. The answer is quite a bit. While I'm at it, the decision to give him long hair has been met with some criticism since it feels very 90s, however this season takes place in 1999, so I'm not very surprised about that. Beyond that though, I actually feel like the long hair suits Nightwing in the same way the spiky hair suits Robin. I also love the simplicity of the costume, the all black with the blue bird in the center. I think it's very memorable to say the least. Also thanks to this we get an amazing moment when Nightwing is chasing a guy down and they pass by Batman. He's 
all yours. At the end of the scene, Catwoman helps Nightwing, with this resulting in Barbara and Dick arguing over Catwoman. She didn't do anything except help. Her kind of help you can do without. Yeah, honey, that's all fine and good, but I like how not even six episodes ago, the shoe was on the other foot where Batgirl trusted Catwoman for absolutely no reason and was betrayed in the end to the dismay of Robin. Anyway, Nightwing wants to go solo, and then we get to hear his theme one more time. I was going to say it's a variation of the Adventures of Batman and Robin theme that I gushed about in Season 3, but it's definitely not the same composition, but I can't put my finger on why it sounds familiar. Oh. Furthermore, you might be asking how a Nightwing that doesn't work with Bruce can afford these tunnels under his place, and I do have an answer for that. With the Flying Graysons being as successful as they were, I can imagine that their will was quite the large sum, a fact that a later episode will confirm. I'm betting he always had this kind of money, but never needed to spend any of it for years since his adopted father was Bruce Wayne. And there you have it, with the next few scenes being dedicated to the partnership between Nightwing and Catwoman. There are a few red flags here as well. Catwoman is talking about having been redeemed, but I've said it a million times, she had gotten parole based on the fact that she would never be Catwoman again, so that's obviously off. And Dick as Robin never really liked her that much anyway, so the partnership is odd. You never really know what side she's on, like this next part where she disappears when the villain walks in. But she actually does save him, and then we get to see more of Nightwing's solo hand-to-hand -hand skills. <laughs> Of course, Batman isn't pleased with the combo, and I can talk more about this scene from Batman's perspective in a few episodes from now, but for right now, this scene is really predictable since you know that Batman's gonna be mad at the team up and he's gonna follow them around only for Nightwing to get betrayed in the end, which all happens by the way, but right when I was about to take points off for the corny setup, this happens. You alright? Just broken hearted. She led us right to the Emerald just like you said. You set me up! Afraid so. This is the reason I pointed out the red flags earlier. This setup just doesn't make any sense, giving the audience a reason to be skeptical, thus making the reveal all the more satisfying. So it shows that Nightwing is willing to work with Batman to get the job done despite his distaste for the man. All that's left is the fight with the guy with the hook. It doesn't really matter what his name is. This fight is surprisingly bloody, with a great interaction between him and Batman. The great Batman has met his match, no? No. After this is a chase scene between Nightwing and Catwoman, and I don't know how Nightwing can use those wings to go up and down, but I'll let that slide. With Selina's capture, the episode ends. And if it wasn't clear already, You Scratch My Back is another superb episode to add to the list for this season with a lot of details to analyze and plenty of surprising moments to keep you guessing throughout. In addition to setting up the mystery behind why Nightwing quit being Robin and how Batgirl came to be the primary sidekick, following the unknown event. Moving on to the final episode of Disc 1, Never Fear. The title says all, but this house is the big appearance for the Scarecrow this season. I don't think he's had a single starring role since Dreams in Darkness from Season 1. He made cameos and guest appearances in previous episodes, but in terms of major screen time, he had three Season 1 episodes. Nothing to Fear, Fear of Victory, and Dreams in Darkness. I liked him in Season 1, especially when we got the design change from the sock puppet look in Nothing to Fear, but I can talk more about him later in this episode. The intro shows a fat guy scaling the rooftops, with Batman and Robin having to find an inventive way to stop him from killing the crowd below. The method being that Batman will stand on one roof, Robin and on the other one across the street, as they shoot their grappling hooks as the building the other is standing on to make a smooth landing for the debris. I had praised a similar moment back in The Worry Men, so I'm happy to do so here as well. The fat guy evidently has no fear and will do whatever he wants. You can probably predict what's up next. The Scarecrow is up to his old tricks, only difference being that the toxin is an inverse of the fear toxin. The former stops people in their tracks as they see their greatest fear, but the latter takes away fear and shows how people act without it. Both of these are very interesting examinations on the human condition. His face is shown in shadow, but damn, he's got a full cloak, white skin, and a walking staff, and oh my god, he literally wears a noose around his neck. This is quite the design, if I do say so myself. Of all character changes, this one is considered the best and the most positive change, and this has been said for good reason. The Scarecrow was scary in concept, but never really came off that way in BTAS until now. I just wish you got more moments with him in this design. I think his earlier appearances would have been brought up because of it. He has been recast as well with the current voice being provided by Jeffrey Combs and he just packs so much dread to his performance and I can't get enough of it. Fear is power. 
Bruce fails to find and steal the gas from Scarecrow and is captured, getting hit with the no fear gas. Think about this. What was the thing that always held Batman back? It was his never-ending fear that he would cross the line and kill one of his enemies. Now he has none. The Scarecrow obviously thought that Bruce was dead after he goes down with the alligators and the blood came up, but no, Bruce killed those alligators. I'm going to guess we have quite the episode in our hands here. Batman is now out for Scarecrow and is being far less careful than usual, telling Robin that despite being gassed, he can handle it. Batman and Robin were set up to find the gas here, but Batman has no fear. Believe it or not, but that shot right there was the thing that told me that the revamp art style helped more than it hindered. I showed footage of it back in season one, but I didn't talk about it in depth. The proof of concept for BTAS was on the first disc of season one, and they showed it to Warner Brothers when being tasked to make a gritty Batman cartoon. The animation was a lot different than the final product though, with shots you'd never see in BTAS. Did you see that? We just saw that shot in season four, only now it looks even better. The animators are finally able to do things on the show that they weren't able to do before. As I've said, season three was a big step up in this category, but nothing on this level. This brings us to a typical Batman interrogation, which we have seen numerous times in the show. But this time there's the added no fear twist. I, I can't, you kill me. Death is death. Does it matter who administers it? He's gonna fill the tunnels with it. Just in time for rush hour. Help me, please! Yeah! I hope it's clear that this guy was about to die if Robin didn't save him. If I was Robin at this point, I'd be terrified. But this Robin's not stopping there. Good on this kid for doing that, by the way. I mean, really, here is Robin's father figure going completely out of control and he can either watch or take action and try to stop Scarecrow before Batman crosses the line he can't uncross. This is followed by Batman acting really shady in an attempt to be untied. Look at how his face is covered in shadow as Robin walks towards him. It really is imagery that leaves an impact. Anything from anyone except this. Get him off me. Taking a closer look at the animation following the capture of Robin, Batman's fighting style is best shown in this very scene. I get that I've hammered in the intensity at this point, however, he's literally tossing people out of the window on a moving train. It makes for a very cool visual spectacle, however, it's really interesting just to see what Batman's capable of. Fool! You'll get us killed. You're not trying to scare me, are you? You can't! Watch me. <laughs> I don't like how quickly the antidote takes effect, however the writers did need some way for the story to end with Batman back to normal. And I don't have too many objections to this because of the fact that it isn't contrived. Scarecrow was going to sell this antidote at a price or else he was flooding the city with no fear gas. It's just that for my liking it was a bit too quick to make Batman revert. With that said, the episode ends with Crane's plot foiled as Batman and Robin see the sunrise. Um, last night when I tied you up, I didn't mean- Don't apologize. You were right. Yeah, but it, it was kind of scary. A little fear is a good thing. And that was Never Fear. Yet another tremendous episode. The stakes were high, the plot kept you on the edge of your seat with how you never knew how far Batman was willing to go, with the great choice being to make this an episode of Batman and Robin since we get to see the intensity of Batman through Robin's eyes. And with the debut of a new Scarecrow, I'm having a hard time thinking of something I didn't enjoy in this episode. A lot of praise needs to go to Kevin Conroy's performance here. He shows incredible range as he sounds cold and lifeless as Batman without his fears holding him back. With Matthew Valencia also doing a great job showing how scary Batman's actions are from Robin's perspective. Another thing I love in this episode is the imagery that I've talked about, such as Batman's face being in the shadows, the blood of the alligators rising to the top of the water, and the shots of the scarecrow. It just creates a very dark atmosphere. And that's it for Disc 1 of BTAS Volume 4. Like I said, this season has 24 episodes split amongst 4 discs, 6 episodes each. 
So far, this season has been a home run. I know that I said the same thing in my review of season three, but the bar has been raised even higher. There hasn't been a single episode so far that I didn't like with plenty of interesting things to talk about in each and every single one. We still have 18 episodes to go, but the fact that the video has gone on this long should be a sign of how good these episodes have been. Episode seven, Joker's Millions. Yeah, I'm not waiting. This is the best Joker episode yet. It opens an intense chase between Batman and Joker in a DVD store of all places, with this scene confirming one thing. Quick, more bullets! Sorry, Puddin', that was the last clip. You know how expensive they are. The Joker and Harley don't have any money, and you might be wondering why that is. Well, let's all open up our copies of Superman the Animated Series Season 2 and take a look at the episode World's Finest for the answer. The Joker didn't have much money going into that episode, but of course, he wasn't as bad as he is now. He says that thanks to Batman, all of his operations were shut down. I don't know if the events of Holiday Nights have anything to do with that, but that's neither here nor there. The Joker stole a giant piece of kryptonite with the following proposition for Lex Luthor. Pay me one billion dollars and I'll kill Superman. I don't know why, but I always love the delivery of that line. Needless to say, this plan didn't really work out, and come to think of it, Joker blew up at the end. <laughs> but that's nothing new. The fact that he always comes back with no explanation just brings a massive smile on my face. The next scene is absolutely brilliant, as Harley and Joker run out of gas. Although one funny detail is how clearly the footage of the Batmobile was directly reused from You Scratch My Back, but whatever. I don't even know what to say, it's just one genius line after another. And as Batman approaches, the Joker then ejects himself out of the car and flies away. But of course, they only had one, so Harley gets arrested. Joker is staying at this terrible apartment building that would make Bullock scoff. He lives here under this ridiculous fake name, Joe Kerr. A letter came for you today, Mr. Uh, Kerr. By the way, you're two weeks late with your rent. Sue me. This next scene sets up the story, not without several witty lines. Dear sir, we regret to inform you of the passing of Mr. Edward, a.k.a. King Barlow. Ooh, that's good news. I hated him. Who, in accordance with his last wishes, has bequeathed to you the total... $250 million? <laughs> Joker now buys his sanity and a good reputation with his lawyers. This is almost a parody of season three. In that, we got episode after episode of villains going straight but being pulled back to crime. And in Double Talk, we got a twist ending. Here, now we're just laughing at the trope at this point since everyone knows this isn't going to end well, but the concept is just so funny with Batman being really pissed off about it. The only part of this episode I don't like is Barbara and Dick trying to get into the Iceberg Lounge. Oh, wait, I guess I haven't talked about that. It'll be more relevant in the ultimate thrill, which is just a few episodes from now, but I'll give you the Cliff Notes version. Penguin now runs a nightclub and claims to be a legitimate businessman, while doing his dealings on the side. Anyway, I don't like Barbara needing to pretend to be a brat and use her status as the commissioner's daughter to get in, since that adds very little to the story, except the fact that the Penguin, of course, is the butt of the joke, as he oh so frequently is on BTAS. The lounge is raided by King Barlow's old crew looking to kill Joker since he wanted the money, with Batgirl and Nightwing now putting a stop to it. This begs the question of why King Barlow would give the Joker the money to begin with since they hate each other so much. We have another question to deal with. What about Harley? Oh, well a man with such high social status as the Joker couldn't possibly associate himself with the lowly, insane Harley Quinn, now could he? It would be much cheaper to hire a new one, with Harley's reaction being exactly what you'd expect. This scene of him hiring a new Harley is just so funny. Like, it's not really because of what he's saying, it's just because of how no censor these days would let these insults pass. Take a look. Too fat. Too small. Too old. No. Darn. And now it's time for the conflict. A man from the IR frickin' S shows up and tells Joker about how much income tax he owes. 250 million minus Uncle Sam's current state and federal percentages. This should clear up your account. Ah! 137 million? 
Yes, and if I don't pay up, I'll go to jail for tax evasion. I'm crazy enough to take on Batman, but the IRS, no, thank you. Are you kidding me? For once, I'm saying that in a positive way. The Joker just said, I'm crazy enough to take on Batman, but the IRS, no, thank you. What other Batman show has this? The unexpected nature of the plot makes it so funny. In addition to great one-liners like, Drown the kids and shoot the neighbors. We've got a winner. This is the kind of dialogue that elevates a show from being good for kids, just generally being good. Ooh, maybe I should have hired the fat guy. I mean, again, the IRS is after Joker for income tax. That's just funny. I don't know what to say. But you have seen nothing yet. The Joker is trying to find the money for the IRS, but all the bills left have King Barlow's face on them. This is when the whole story comes into light. I found this. Hiya, Joker. If you're playing this tape, you probably figured out you've been had. Yeah, I left you some cash, but only 10 million, which knowing you, you've already blown. All the other stuff, money, jewels, and gold, it's all fake. See, I always hated your guts, and this was the perfect payback. By now, you're probably out of real money. The IRS is after you, and you can't admit I fooled you, or you'll be the laughing stock of the underworld. That joke's on you, sucker. I got the last laugh after all. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god! I'm running out of words for this episode! So anyway, next up, fake Harley starts doing that annoying laugh again and Joker just pulls out a gun and tries to shoot her! We also get a good reference to continuity as the assistant mentions the laughing fish from season 2. Maybe you could raise the cash by pulling one of your classic routines, like them laughing fish. Good idea, Ernie. Let's let Batman know I did it so he can kick my keister right back into Arkham! Nah, uh, you! Just figured I'd say that because I saw the episode. And we still aren't done with this episode since now Harley's trying to escape Arkham. As Bruce tries to find the Joker at the Iceberg Lounge, only to obviously tell this isn't the real Joker. You'll understand if I refuse. The last time we met, you tried to throw me off a building. I did? Well, that was so long ago. It was last month. That was also a reference to continuity since this happened in World's Finest. Batman then interrogates the guy to find out where the real Joker is, and he's trying to steal the money without anyone knowing it was him. But now Batman, Batgirl, and Nightwing are onto him. Don't be stupid! You can't save that money! I don't want to save it! I want to go with it! You'd better call your fancy lawyers. Here. It's on me. To close the episode, the status quo is back in place as Joker goes back to Arkham. <laughs> so I'll let the taxpayers foot my bill again. Besides, it'll be nice to see the old gang. One of them's dying to see you too, Puddin. Harley? The one and only. You... you don't know how happy I am to see you. Welcome to the club. <laughs> now, baby, I can... Ah! Explain! Ah! And that was Joker's Millions. After thoroughly discussing it, it is top tier season 4 material. While it's not a serious or deep story like Sins of the Father or Old Wounds, an episode I'll get to, the fact of the matter is that this episode is almost flawless. I am serious, I had thought the scene outside the nightclub was a bit needless, but it still moves the story along. And gets another shot in on the penguin. Looking past that, this episode is just filled to the brim with creativity and so many moments you just can't forget about. Like when Joker blows up the TV or hires fake Harley when the freaking IRS guy shows up. Genius in a way other shows aimed at kids wouldn't even dare to think of. The humor is what stands out here. I can tell everyone had a fun time with this episode since it shows in the final product. Like I said, this is a damn near perfect episode, one of my favorite episodes of BTAS and possibly the DCAU as a whole. Which brings me to the next episode, Growing Pains, which takes place after Sins of the Father but before Holiday Nights for a reason that shall become clear.
The episode begins with an unfamiliar little girl running through the alleyways as she's then harassed by this motorcycle gang, until Robin arrives to save her, which establishes that evidently Robin is allowed to patrol the streets by himself. This girl acts peculiar as she says that someone is after her. At the same time, a mystery man's wreaking havoc. I feel like you might be able to guess the plot at this point. Robin is concerned for the well-being of the girl, much to the dismay of the oh-so-robotic Batman. From the sound of it, she belongs in a runaway center. And you need to keep your head clear. In this line of work, one slip is too many. Despite the cliché, this does lead to a funny interaction between Tim and Alfred. He always treats me like a kid. Pardon me for saying so, but you are a kid. Sure, take his side. Anyway, Robin decides that he's gonna search for her himself, with a long montage of Robin trying to find her as we see the real pits of Gotham. This is barely connected to the plot of the episode, but this montage only made me think about the point I made last season. That being that it would be hard to find a good reason for any super criminal to want to reform because high society doesn't accept them, and not being a criminal means they have to live in torn up buildings that the corrupt are going to use for their own gain. My examples included Appointment in Crime Alley and I Am The Night, however here it's the worst it's ever been with people sleeping on the floor without a roof. These areas suck. Once again, not a big part of the plot, but something interesting to say the least. That's when they all find out that, surprise, the mystery girl and man are connected. But he gets away in a strange fashion, leaving a weird substance behind which can only be one man, Clayface. I mentioned back in Holiday Nights that we didn't know how Clayface came back after Mudslide where he died, and here's our answer. When Clayface fell into the water, it made his cells too unstable to make a solid form, in addition to his deteriorating conditions from that episode. At sea, he came into contact with the waste from a chemical company, and this is what brought him back, and better than ever. So much better that he even sent a scout in the form of a little girl to get info on his surroundings for him. But she forgot about her true purpose, and this is why he was after her. I will say, the fact that this girl is just a clay monstrosity is a surprising twist in what I was ready to call a cliche episode. I do feel bad for Robin here. He doesn't want to help this girl because she's a girl, but because she reminds him of himself just a few episodes ago, just scraping by, always on the run, in the pits of Gotham City. Not a life that's going to lead to great places, I can tell you that much. Anyway, Batman uses the tracker he placed in Robin's belt to find him, and I'm guessing he realized that he might need one after Dick Grayson as Robin got captured in Demon's Quest. Couldn't that make a plot hole in Return of the Joker? Eh, maybe not. The whole episode's about Batman finally treating Robin less like a kid and more like a partner, so maybe he took it out by then. In an effort to save Robin, the girl jumps into Clayface, which sets him back a few feet, with Robin instantly retaliating as Batman arrives to stop the whole thing. Ending the episode on a sad note for Robin. We'll book him on the robberies in B&E, right? Anything else? Yeah. Murder. I realize now that I don't have much to say about this episode from an analytical standpoint, but overall I did enjoy it. I enjoyed the look at the people of Gotham as well as how dingy the city can be, and the best part being how the ending is nowhere near as uplifting as these things usually go. Overall, not an episode with a lot going on, so I'd just say it's pretty good, but not much else. Now it's time for an episode that I never saw coming. Love is a crock. Well, what do I mean? The episode opens with a black and white TV show with oh so familiar music. Did you use the whole box of bubble bath? I didn't mean to. Anyway, a completely drunk guy gets pulled into this motel by his wife as she gets pissed off at him. Of course, he lost the keys to the room and needed another one. Does that remind anybody of the hotel break-in in Chapter 3 of Sly 3? I don't know, that's the first thing I thought of. You got the keys to the room? Yeah, come on. Um... Mother! Don't you have him? No! You're the responsible! Let's just bang on the But let's get back to the episode in question. My husband lost our room key. Fetters 703. I'll get you a duplicate. Mary Doll is back, eh? The drunk guys served a few purposes in the story right out the gate. We can start with the obvious one. Well. Actually, they're all pretty self-explanatory, but still. He gave the rundown of Mary's past, and if you need more specifics, Mary debuted in the Season 3 episode, Baby Doll, one of the most popular episodes. 
In it, we found out that she was one in a million born with systemic hyperplasia, which in this universe means that her growth was stunted a long time ago. She was the star of Love That Baby, a parody of your run-of-the-mill family sitcom where Baby had all kinds of wacky adventures. When she was upstage, she quit the show and moved on, but her career tanked as she couldn't get networks to bring it back. In addition, the rest of the cast moved on as well, but she physically couldn't move on because of how bad she was typecast. But then she kidnapped the old cast and crew with Batman and Robin saving the day. I rewatched the last few moments of that episode before writing about this one, and that ending just still gets to me to this day. But speaking of that ending, she must have completed rehabilitation since she's working at this motel at the front desk. I'm surprised that Bruce Wayne didn't just get her a job since he did that for Arnold Wesker in Double Talk, and his crimes were arguably more egregious than what Mary had done. Anyway, the drunk guy provokes Mary into attacking him, to which she returns to her place right away. Once again, I've gotta feel sorry for her. By this point, unlike a lot of people we've seen on this show, she really isn't trying to be a part of that identity, since she even disassociated herself with the bodyguard from the last episode. She probably wants to forget everything in regards to her confrontation with Batman, but she's forced to do so constantly, which is once again a product of her actions a long time ago. But I can only imagine what it's like. She turns on the TV, only to have a 24-hour Love That Baby marathon playing. Our baby doll marathon will continue after... Even though the guy on the TV just referred to it as Baby Doll, well that's not the name of the show. Just saying. Back to my real point, she angrily changes the channel to a live trial of none other than... Wait, who the hell is that? Obviously it's Croc with his new design, but I don't mind the design, and I just really hate the guy this season. They recasted him for some reason, but the voice is just so generic as a tough guy as opposed to being the distinct one he used to have. I was gonna complain that his funny side isn't even here, but then I remember that he never had one. Can I just get this off my chest? Everyone remembers Croc as being the I threw a rock at him guy from Almost Got Him, but Croc was never that stupid in BTAS. That was actually Batman dressed as him, subtly telling us that Batman thinks that Croc is stupid. And he treats him as such as Bane. Speaking of which, in Bane, Croc was running his own operation and in his debut episode, Vendetta, he had solely plotted to murder Bullock. This is a massive tangent, but I'm basically saying that Croc in this season isn't that different. I just don't like his voice and the things he does in this episode that we'll see. Croc claims that he's a misunderstood figure since he is the way he is, and this, of course, speaks to Mary, who clearly has nobody else to latch onto at this point. Croc has played this card before in Sideshow, but he led to his own undoing by fighting with Batman. At this point, I feel little to no sympathy for the guy. Croc gets sentenced to death, but busts out with Batman stopping him. Mary stops by to visit him at Arkham Asylum. Unless this is his first time here, this is another bit of continuity that doesn't ruin the plot, since in the grand scheme of things it doesn't make a big difference, but in all the previous seasons he was just put in jail for being a criminal, not for being insane. But then again, he was at Arkham in Trial, but he was in the GCPD in Bane. I don't know, maybe Trial takes place after Bane despite coming before. I mean, this season's done that with Holiday Nights, Sins of the Father, and Growing Pains, so who knows? If that was the case and he was changed to Arkham after Bane and before Trial, then there actually isn't an issue here, but... You didn't come to witness me do DCAU math, we have an episode to talk about. Mary saves Croc and then they become a Harley and Ivy-esque combo, but Mary actually feels like they're a kindred spirit, with all the papers even writing about them, even the Daily Planet. I always thought it was interesting that Dahl had redesigned Croc's sewer lair to resemble a 50s sitcom house. Almost like that's all she knows. They then plan their next move, but it's ruined by Batman and Batgirl, and in a rage, Croc decides to leave, and things get... interesting. <laughs> You're in the chips, huh, Croc? Yeah, I'm heading for the big time, and I mean solo. Oh? What about the little woman? Couple more jobs <laughs> and I ditch the Cupid doll and blow this burg. <laughs> Oh boy, poor Mary. Once again, I'm just left feeling sorry for her. She didn't do anything wrong here. Well, I'm talking about the relationship. I know she was just on a mass crime spree, but still. My point is, she only showed Croc compassion and he just doesn't care about her or her needs. It makes me sad because she could be a good person, but things like this keep happening. Only showing that he's a manipulative ass as seen in Sideshow, just using people around him to get ahead. And I can't wait to see Batman take him down. Back to Mary though. Despite her rants about not being a child, she definitely doesn't handle this breakup like an adult. Her plan is to blow up the city with her and Croc spending their last moments together. My god, this only goes to show that her mental state is practically non-existent at this point. Again, I just wish she had been dealt a better hand. But that doesn't mean she isn't worthy of criticism, since she says she wants to be treated like an adult, 
but in her whole debut episode and this scene goes to show how she doesn't act like one. I said I wanted to see Croc get what is coming to him and thankfully that happens right now. She's crazy! She's gonna nuke the whole group. Batgirl's working on shutting off the reactor as Batman goes to find Croc as he's now trying to kill Mary! Hey baby, now we'll play my kind of game. Seriously, this is a very action-packed climax. Now let's see the ending. You shouldn't have done it, Crocky. You shouldn't have made Baby angry. We could have been so happy and lived happily ever after. Just like on TV. <laughs> If I were to complain about anything here, it would be how we never get to see what Batman thinks of any of this. Beyond the scene where Batgirl asks what Croc and Mary would do on a date with him only responding with this... I don't want to think about it. Which was funny, but I mean, we never get on the same level of emotion as the ending of Baby Doll. Sure, Batman didn't say anything there either, but his actions spoke louder than his words. Here, we really don't get that. But I wish we did get his reaction since this is also Mary's final appearance. Which means that I'm a little let down by the ending. Mary Doll is a character that I feel deserves a happy ending, so maybe one minute saying that she works for Bruce as a secretary or something would do the job just fine. However, as it stands, her final words are quite tragic. Just like on TV. That's depressing for her since if it wasn't clear enough, TV was the only source of happiness for this woman. As a result, that's really all she knows. A melancholy end for her character, but what more can you do? There was a lot to say about that one, so thankfully we have two whole episodes that aren't too deep and as a result shouldn't take us too long. So next up is Torch Song. Throughout my videos on BTAS, another series I've always drawn comparison to would be 2004's The Batman, since alongside the DCAU's Justice League, The Batman was one of my first exposures to the Batman mythos. The relevance of that statement is this. In The Batman, I was first exposed to the villain Firefly, real name being Garfield Lins. Honestly, I really don't know what is the most accurate portrayal of the character, since as of now I've only seen him in three works total. Here in the DCAU, where he appears in this season and makes an appearance in the second season of Justice League, his origins being something we'll go into as we talk about this episode. The Batman is the second time I've seen an incarnation of Firefly, and lastly the Arkham games, where he was one of the assassins after Batman and Arkham Origins, and then there was a stupid side quest related to him in Arkham Knight. He's not an assassin in this episode, or in The Batman, where he was about corporate espionage. Point is that these three appearances are the only ones I've seen, and I have no idea which is the comic book version, since they're all so different. But I do think it's actually agreed that one of his best appearances was the Batman, to the point where it beats out the DCAU version of Firefly. Yeah, I just said that. FYI, the Batman beating out the DCAU is rare, if not unheard of. What he does there is more interesting and his design is much better than just a grey suit. All this talk has led to the question, what is his story in BTAS? Well, let's find out. The episode opens as Bruce is being dragged into some concert by this new girl that probably should have been Veronica for the sake of consistency, however that doesn't really matter. This woman has no impact on the story. They pass by Barbara thus setting up the fact that she's in the episode and that's when we get backstage. I remember when you used to dress like that for me. Gar, we have a show to put on, remember? Don't worry Cass, I won't disappoint you. My job is the only thing I care about now. Let it go Garfield. Whatever you thought we had is as cold as a burnout fuse. Hey, you're the expert on burning people, you little tramp. And if you think I'm going to step aside like one of your pretty boys... <clears throat> okay, that's it. It's your last show. You heard that, Frank? Cut him a check, he's out. Damn. Pretty creepy for a Saturday morning. But he is the villain, so no harm, no foul. You've probably already guessed what's going to happen in this episode. And let me just say, you're right. Linz tries to fry Cassidy alive with the stage effects as Bruce is not able to help since his date is right next to him. And to that I say good riddance, because this song is garbage. My cheeks are hot, my lips are burning, the flames of love dance in my eyes. I've got just one, that's what a warning. Play with me and you play with fire. But that's when Batgirl saves the day. The police investigate Linz's apartment, to which they find that he has a wall of Cassidy posters. Ugh. Once again, the plot has basically been revealed already and we're only four minutes in. But this leads to a great line from Bullock. I'll get some pictures. I'm gonna check the fridge. Yeah, there's a lot of evidence in there, detective. Shut up. Linz, now Firefly, tries to kill Cassidy again at a show with Batman and Batgirl arriving to stop him, to which Batman has dropped from a terrifyingly high altitude and just barely survived. Sorry. Gotta fly. Ugh. 
seriously, Batman has taken a real beating this season. Long story short, Firefly captures Cassidy with Batman and Batgirl just barely surviving an explosion. Batgirl broke her leg, and so Batman's gonna have to go solo on this one with this fire-resistant bat suit. Probably intended to sell toys, although I think this is the very first time in all BTAS that this has happened. SDAS had a lot of various suits for Superman as well, in spite of the fact that in both cases I'm not too upset since it was given context in the shows. Although I don't know where Alfred got any of the material for this. Hence why I like it when Lucius knows who Batman is. Makes more sense that he makes these enhancements. But back onto the toys discussion, can I ask you guys, as kids, did anyone actually want these dumb variations? I myself always prefer the normal versions and not Deep Dive Batman or T-Shield Batman or Viking Batman. Back to the episode. Firefly's plan centers around turning the city into ashes with a chemical that burns through anything, but it can't be put out. Following that, Firefly would take Cassidy with him as they fall into obscurity, which is almost the exact same plan I used at Cold Comfort from a few episodes ago, only with fire instead. But of course, Batman saves the day, and that's basically it. I think this episode is a classic case of getting worse upon closer inspection. The episode makes for an entertaining watch, but from an analytical perspective, this story is easily predicted from the first five minutes with nothing else added to make it more interesting. There isn't much in the way of action, and the ending is really weird. Cass now has PTSD from the fire. Okay, I feel bad for her since she didn't do anything to deserve this beyond firing a creep who didn't know what boundaries were. In If You're So Smart, Why Aren't You Rich, it was unfortunate that Mockridge was going to have to live with the threat of Riddler killing him for the rest of his life, but he was a jerk, so therefore he got what was coming to him. There was one scene where Cass tries to seduce Batman into protecting her from fireflies, so maybe she did something like that to make Linz think they were legit, but the problem is that we don't get told his side of the story, nor do we see the past relationship to get the facts of what really happened, leaving me with a ton of mixed messages from the ending. The fact that Linz is such a creep and is portrayed as such with no demon characteristics makes him a weaker character. The other versions of Firefly that I've already discussed didn't have many things going for them either, but they didn't have many things going against them at the same time, with the Batman's Firefly getting several episodes to develop, where this guy just gets this season and a very small role in a later episode, and an even smaller role in JL Season 2. But I've spent long enough on this episode. It could have been better, but at the same time it could have been worse, so let's move on. The next episode, titled The Ultimate Thrill, begins in a party blimp as our new villain Roxy Rocket is holding the place up for jewels. I was about to go on a paragraph long rant about how she jumps out the plane without the bag, or if you look closely at the opening scene, she puts the bag in her jacket. But if you blink, you miss it. The Batwing is severely damaged after the really boring minute long chase scene, but it does lead to a good line from Alfred. This is coming out of your allowance, Master Bruce. Her backstory revealed later in the episode is that Roxy was once a stunt actress who kept on trying to top herself with the stunts, to the point where she was costing the studio a lot of money, and when Hollywood has to spend too much money, you're fired. Hence why she does outlandish robberies for the top buyer, the Penguin. We had seen the Iceberg Lounge before in Joker's Millions, but now we get to see how he's using it as a front for his side dealings. In the next scene, Batman knows a wing suit to sell toys with. Two episodes back to back, eh? What's cool about the wingsuit is how it shows the improved technology yet again since we saw back in BTAS that Batman had to use the hang glider to go through the air when he's not in the Batwing. The wingsuit is just a more effective design than the hang glider and I like that. Penguin gets fed up with Roxy's recklessness and sends his goons to kill her with Batman interrogating him over the location. Damn, that's a lot of money and property damage. Roxy easily beats Penguin's henchgirls. Batman arrives to stop her as they board a rocket that's heading towards a cliffside. I was wondering why there was a cliffside right next to Gotham City, but technically we also saw something similar in the episode The Forgotten from Season 1. Maybe both take place here, who knows. I get it. We live to play another day. W what's this? My kind of game, and you lost. And that's it for the episode. No lie, The Ultimate Thrill is the Season 4 episode that I have the least to say about, which in this case is a flaw. A good percent of this episode's runtime is dedicated to action and chase scenes that really don't leave any impact while watching them since it all feels so soulless, if that makes any sense. I really don't have strong feelings for Roxy as a character, and so her dodging a million bullets from the Penguin just leaves me yawning. Since this episode was so dry, let's not waste any time and move on to Over the Edge. One of the things I've been building up is how Season 4 utilizes mystery to get you engaged. Remember what I said about the first two episodes. 
For the characters, nothing was out of place but a new route from Holiday Nights, but now we're interested because we want to know the story. And that story is revealed in Sins of the Father. But on the subject of Over the Edge, this episode's intro is possibly one of the most intriguing we've ever seen. Take a look. What is going on? Gordon knows who Batman is? He and the cops are chasing him through the Batcave as Dick's Robin suit is destroyed? The Batmobile is blown to pieces as Alfred is brought to the ground by the cops? I know that was mostly summary, but that really speaks for itself. This is how a Saturday morning Batman episode opens? Imagine seeing this, having no idea what was going on. It still blows my mind how you can have so much intrigue in two minutes time. Batman and Robin just barely escape in the boat, but the cops were waiting for them here too! Thankfully, Nightwing manages to arrive in time and freaking blows up the boat the cops were in! The CGI Batboat here is also of much higher quality than anything we saw in Sub-Zero. I figured I'd mention that since this is on a TV budget, whereas Sub-Zero was direct to DVD. Although technically I'm not sure which one would get a higher budget from the offset, but still. It's now time for us to learn why any of this is happening. Scarecrow is up to his usual antics at City Hall, with Batman and Robin defeating all the goons as Batgirl chased after Crane. The tone of this flashback is on point. Of course, we have Scarecrow's amazing design, but at the same time, there isn't an adventurous piece of music in the background. It's mostly ambient noise, making the whole scene feel very eerie. God, I've talked about less in censors before, but that was mostly in references to blood and guns. Nobody actually died! If you asked me if this was suitable for kids, I'd have to think about that. Batgirl is smacked across the face, falls hundreds of stories, and crashed into a moving police car that her father was driving. Even season 4 Batman is surprised, and that's saying something. The seriousness of this tragedy is shown off not just in the gruesome animation, not just the haunting music, but the voice actors really sell this plot. We see a side of Gordon we've never seen before, as well as Bullock. He's always hated Batman, but never to this extent. That's as far as you go, murderer. Playtime's over, freak. Lose the belt, lose the mask. Now! I said now! This goes for every character. We also see the moments before the opening as Gordon has a really intense call with Batman over the phone, resulting in the cops bursting through the door. We don't get to see what he's looking at, but before Batman enters the Batcave, he stops and looks. This has got to be that giant frame of his parents that we often see in the most tragic moments, like when Bruce and Dick first bond in Robin's Reckoning, or that heart-wrenching scene where Bruce gets the letter from Andrea and decides to commit to being Batman and Phantasm. I can only imagine what he was thinking. After all, in Scarecrow's debut, Nothing to Fear, we saw his greatest fear was being a failure in the eyes of his father, something we've seen numerous times in the show. So, I can only imagine that's what he's thinking in this moment. Nightwing tries to get some supplies, but he's shot up by the police and arrested as well, leading to a heartbreaking moment between Tim and Bruce, as Tim still clings on to hope that this will work out, but Bruce does not share his sentiment. They've got him downtown. I figure we break in, take out the guards, and spring Nightwing and Alfred at the same time. No. What do you mean? It's over, Tim. Gordon feels betrayed. And maybe he was. He won't give up until he gets me. You have to leave me now. Give yourself up. No one will blame you for what happened. What about you? 
I don't know. Gordon has spent so many resources on this manhunt, but because of this, Mayor Hill fires Gordon over the fact. But before this is made official, Gordon strikes a deal, and it is actually this point where the episode starts to lose me. Not in a terrible way, but just not as good as before. Gordon has set up a trap for Batman at the funeral, and that trap is... Bane. Gordon struck a deal with Bane to capture Batman. I just don't buy this. I mean, I get it, he's desperate, but does he really think Bane will want to honor this agreement? Especially after how bad he was embarrassed by Batman in the previous Bane episode. The events of that episode are never really mentioned, but still. Also, can I say that I vastly prefer this Bane design of the BTAS one? Bane in here is less comic accurate than Season 3, but he just looks more menacing with the red on black eyes and the spikes around his mask. But still, how did anyone know Batman would go to that exact door to be hit by Bane? It's a bit too coincidental for my liking. Putting that aside, Bane challenges Batman to a fight to the death, and he accepts. This fight is even more dynamic than last season's Bane fight, since one character never has the advantage for too long, as they both land deadly blows throughout. Of course, in the end, Gordon is betrayed by Bane, and is about to be killed! But Batman saves him. Yeah, this episode was a dream. I'm not as upset as you might think, though. This has been a theme with Season 4. They make ideas that are hard to swallow work out. What really happened was that Barbara was sprayed with the Scarecrow's fear toxin, and a new kind that affects your nightmares. This inspires her to finally tell her father about being Batgirl, however, he doesn't want her to tell him since she is an adult and anything that she gets herself into is her choice. I actually like that for Gordon's character. He probably already knows that she's Batgirl, I mean, a mask over your eyes or not, you can tell if someone's your own child. He's basically giving her the agency in this decision to work with Batman, thus ending the episode. This is a very popular episode, and I dare say it's one of the most popular in the season. I greatly enjoyed it since it's a stunning what-if scenario with a lot of depth coming from all the characters involved. The dream twist also gives context as to why the finale was a bit contrived since most dreams are. But it ended where it needed to. Batman and Gordon are on good terms, but in the end are killed by Bane. Not much else to say there in regards to the story. But from a writing standpoint, since the climax is a bit contrived, it can't beat the likes of Joker's Millions or a few episodes we'll talk about later. However, the ride there was quite enjoyable. Episode 13, Mean Seasons. Now this is an episode I forgot the plot of completely before rewatching the season. After having seen it, I can tell you I really enjoyed it. The story begins at a slim fashion show, with this couple in the crowd always being able to get a chuckle out of me. Isn't it lovely? I've got to buy one. For who? <gasps> <gasps> What did I do? Once again, I love how that would so not fly nowadays, which adds to the comedy. This event is ruined by a masked woman and her goons, and I have to ask, how many ritzy events have ended with a criminal busting in? I honestly lost count by this point. The perpetrator leaves behind a calendar with the date marked. Her battle tactics are also based on Easter, so you can probably see what her gimmick is based on the title, Mean Seasons. A few months later, Bruce and Lucius have to attend an auto show late that night, and this is when something very interesting happens. By the way, I'm supposed to remind you about Bernie Benson's retirement dinner. It's this Friday. Bernie's retiring? Why? He's 65, Bruce. That's our mandatory retirement age. I thought he was younger. Well, sooner or later we all start touching up the gray. Bruce just straight up had no idea that his own employee, Bernie Benson, was 65 and that this is the required retirement age at Wayne Enterprises. Really, dude? I thought he was younger. It's almost like this guy is losing focus of everything besides being Batman or something. Calendar Girl attacks the auto show and while we're there, we get an intense action scene as Batman sends this guy flying into the hood of the car. No way that guy's walking again. He then slams a car door into the guy charging at him on a motorcycle. My goodness, Batman. Calendar Girl's real name is Paige Monroe. She was once a famous model that you couldn't walk five feet without seeing but suddenly she just disappeared from all marketing. Batman and Batgirl find Paige's old agent, whom is in a really uncomfortable meeting as he's hitting on and touching this young woman. Meeting's been canceled. Thankfully, Batman interrupts as the agent gives the hard truth. I used to be her agent. What about her? What happened to her? She turned 30. 
What are you gonna do? The next scene shows Paige really upset when one of her henchmen walks in when her mask isn't on. At this point, you can piece together the story. Paige was let go of not because of a lack of talent, a lack of good looks, or a lack of consumer interest, but because the studio heads were all considering her too old to be relatable to younger demographics. This is when I realized the DCAU always has high quality commentary on show business. Last season we saw Baby Doll, who was an extreme case of typecasting. Here, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that the commentary is even better than it was in Baby Doll. Admittedly, Mary Doll's insane condition could at times overshadow the commentary. I find Paige very worthy of sympathy, since like I said, her talent or ability was not the problem, it was something that she could not control. Her own age! This actually does exist in our culture nowadays. Recently, I saw an interview for Star Wars The Last Jedi where Mark Hamill had stated the following. When George mentioned that they wanted to do another trilogy, I was, as you say, gobsmacked, but yeah. I, I kept a poker face. I'm pretty good at that. Inside, I was freaking out, but I kept the straight face. Carrie immediately went, I'm in! <laughs> Later, I said, when the meeting was over, I said, Carrie, poker face. I mean, you got to act aloof so you can get yourself the best deal and not be so anxious. She cuts right to the chase. She goes, Mark, what kind of parts are there for women over 50 in Hollywood? The fact that Carrie Fisher knew that no other big budget blockbuster would want her is just tragic, but it's true. Older men like Liam Neeson or Schwarzenegger get cast, but not the women. I'm not trying to spout out some agenda with this either, I'm just calling it as I see it. Paige still has one more victim left to capture as Batman and Batgirl get distracted since Paige leaves them with a giant dinosaur to fight. This dinosaur fight scene does nothing for me to be honest. It's not a real thing, it's just a show prop, so there really isn't much drama. However, right after that is one of my favorite scenes in the whole episode. Bernie Benson's talking to Bruce about the retirement party, but Bruce just calls it off. I'm sorry to disturb you, Mr. Wayne, but I wanted to hand in my final report a little early to get ready for my retirement dinner. I'm afraid I won't be able to attend your retirement dinner, Bernie. I understand, sir. You're very busy. Actually, I've decided to cancel it. Cancel? I'm changing the retirement policy. You can work here for as long as you can do the job. This is one of my favorite scenes since Bruce has actually learned a lesson from all this. He doesn't want to be like the people that fired Paige for no reason, so he lets Bernie work as long as he likes. Which not only shows that Bruce has learned something, but it could teach the audience a thing or two about ageism. Being 65 doesn't mean you can't work, being 35 doesn't make you too old to be a model, and so on. Certain positions are easier when you're younger, but with today's medicine I see no reason why someone who's 70 still can't work at Wayne Enterprises. All that's left for the episode is Batman taking down Paige, which he does. Yeah, the end fight's nothing special, but the episode ends on a very interesting note. Did you read her rights? Yes, sir. Then she knows they don't include this. Ah! No! Don't! Don't look, please! Oh, no. <laughs> She's beautiful. She can't see that anymore. All she sees are the flaws. That was Mean Seasons, and it was quite a solid episode. Probably not on my top 10 or anything, but the villain is sympathetic, the story was interesting with riveting commentary in the film industry. Not much more to say in regards to this episode. The next episode, however, is oftentimes considered one of the worst from the entire show. Get ready for episode 14, Critters. The plot begins as a man named Farmer Brown and his daughter are showing off their latest and most amazing creation. Farm animals that are drugged up to have super strength. I don't really know what that's good for, so let's not waste any more time. It doesn't even take 55 seconds for this event to go wrong. I mean, evidently the show dragged on for an hour, but I was referring to the runtime of the episode. Farmer Brown's practices are outlawed after this, and now he wants revenge. A year later, Bruce is on a date, and... I've just been busy at work. You've got to have a little faith, Sharon. Karen. You're not going to help me, are you? Are you kidding me? Just one episode ago, Bruce couldn't remember his own employee being 65. Now he can't remember this girl's name! Bruce, this is your disguise, you know. You're supposed to be into these women as to look normal. It's like if Clark Kent just used super speed to get to the editor's office at the Daily Planet. Okay, maybe not that obvious, but still, Bruce's public persona is really off the ball in this episode. In cold comfort in this episode, Bruce had intentionally dumb things to Gordon as a disguise, but when it comes to Bernie Benson's age and this girl's name, I don't think he was acting. Life-sized bugs begin to attack, and that's when Bruce fights them as Batman. Gotta love how he tears the thing's arm off, but they aren't in the next frame, but reappear in the frame after that. 
These bugs were just a warm-up act since Farmer Brown and his daughter are preparing for the real thing. I was about to complain about this fake-ass background which looks... terrible. However, it is revealed that this is actually a fake-ass background. So good on them for playing to your expectations. Brown sends in a goat to announce his demand for $50 million, and I find the way its eyes look to be kind of eerie, but that could just be me. But of course, Bullock breaks the tension as usual. Hey, he ate my donut! Because of that outburst, he has to make the delivery and actually tries to sneak into their hideout, which leads to the next surprising twist that Brown and his daughter have both taken the super serum so she can toss Bullock around like nobody's business. As funny as Bullock being chased around in a pigsty is, a criticism I do have with this is that it was technically done already in The Laughing Fish from Season 2 where Joker threw Bullock in a shark tank as Batman arrived and stopped the shark. The next scene is pretty contrived though. I get that the farm folk have taken the steroids they made, however are you really telling me that these two can seriously match Batman, Robin, and Batgirl all at once? There is strength, sure, and then there's actual skill in combat, and I doubt they've had the kind of training that Bruce has had. They all get captured in the end, and I must say, it is a bit weird that he takes Batman's belt, but Robin and Batgirl still have theirs. Since this is the case, I don't know why they don't have anything to escape this trap. That trap being that they're all inside a missile filled with bugs that's going to explode in Gotham and then the bugs will come to life and kill everyone. While writing that sentence, I realize I have absolutely no idea what I just said. What kind of plot is this? I'm just going to go out on a limb and say this is by far the weirdest BTAS episode ever made. It doesn't make for a terrible watch, however the plot is cliched not even a minute in. There is tons of filler, like the middle where Batman and co have to fight a miniature army of creatures before the ransom demand. And I skipped over that fact entirely because it adds nothing to the story. But I am getting ahead of myself. The heroes escape, blow up the missile, and the farm folk are on their way to jail. Well, today's certainly been one fine howdy do. Don't sweat it, Pops. It's only 10 to 20. And maybe we can find you and Daisy May a nice prison farm. I basically gave my thoughts already, but in regards to whether or not this is the worst episode, eh, I don't think so. It's not very good. In fact, from a critical standpoint, it's probably one of the worst episodes this season, maybe bottom 10 of BTS as a whole. But I still got way more enjoyment out of this than I've got Batman in my basement or Prophecy of Doom or Moon of the Wolf. Even considering the philorific fight scene in the middle, I was still not really bored throughout the runtime of the episode. Overall, a weak episode, but definitely not unwatchable. Next up is Cult of the Cat. Catwoman previously appeared in You Scratch My Back, but the big part of that episode was the mystery of Nightwing, as opposed to Catwoman herself. So we now have an episode centered around her. Beginning as she's being chased by a cult of cat worshippers. Obviously, she's stolen from them and makes an escape with the cult leader vowing to find her and sacrifice her blood while they're at it. I never minded the new design of Catwoman, however, the all-black color scheme really makes her blend in with the cult a little too much in my opinion. Catwoman is clearly in over her head and needs some help, and with that, one of my favorite Batman lines of all time is said to her. You needed a warm place to spend the night. Kind of. I know of one. Jail. That was just so well-timed to deliver from Kevin Conroy. Amongst all the boring chase scenes that I've called out this season, we have a really good one here because of the fact that Batman and Catwoman are bantering back and forth, which gives the scene more character. I wouldn't be safe there. Safe from what? Next question. And you can't get rid of them. They're like old boyfriends or warts. And you figured I'd save your skin. That's what you do, isn't it? Normally. But it'll cost you. Hmm. What do you have in mind? Everything you've ever stolen. It all goes back to the owners. You're crazy! That's my life's work you're talking about. All right then. They get away, but for some reason this cult woman does that stupid cliche where she takes off her mask once the chase is done. For what reason would someone in a private, unknown organization want their face potentially revealed to onlookers? I don't know why, but that two seconds worth of animation just really triggers me. Batman and Catwoman are separated as she gets kidnapped, so he needs to find her. We have seen many interrogations from Batman before this, however, never before has he taken someone into the Batcave and dropped them off a cliff! That just goes to show that he is serious about this one. Catwoman manipulates her way into the cult and she's now going to become an honorary member, and... Really, Selina? You're still trying to steal from these guys? In Season 3's Catwalk, we saw that he did want to help and was genuinely curious as to why she would have done what she did. And in You Scratch My Back, we saw that Batman had still yet to forgive Selina for what happened in Catwalk since he said he didn't trust her. 
Here he's just as surprised as I am. I don't believe it. You're going to try to steal from them again, aren't you? I see it more like teaching them a lesson. You're the one who needs to learn something. These people are too dangerous. Not feeling any sympathy since this is ridiculous. Here is this cult that's ready to sacrifice her blood for stealing from them, and she's gonna try stealing again! Even after all the work Batman put in to get here. So Batman goes down after one hit and is used as a sacrifice instead. Catwoman finally comes to her senses and fights alongside him as they destroy the cult. I don't know where Catwoman's control over cats we've seen numerous times in this episode came from, but I do like the contrast as she gets licked by this giant cat right after Batman's been torn up from it. Once the battle's done, Gordon reveals that there isn't much evidence left, cutting to the ending. Ah, oh, the heck with it. You know, Isis, I had no idea being on the right side of the law could be so satisfying. I guess virtue is its own reward. I was hoping for it to fade out and then fade in the next morning with all the stuff gone. That sounds like something Batman could pull off. But regardless, that was Cult of the Cat. After an episode like Critters, it's good to see a back to basics plot with great character interactions and action scenes. We saw Catwoman get entangled with a similar group back in her debut episode, The Cat and the Claw. This episode is much better than that one, which shows improvement. In addition to that, I think it's one of the better Catwoman appearances. Beyond Catwalk, her solo appearances have never been great, so I'm glad to say that we have one right here. Now that that's been said, bring on the next episode, Animal Act. It's at this point that I realize I haven't mentioned the DCAU wiki much yet in this video. But whenever I watch an episode, I instantly go there and see if there's any interesting facts that I missed. I didn't find many things that were important enough to put in this script, though. But I did learn they reused a lot of the explosion effects. I guess that saves time. But come to think of it, the reused Batmobile shot in Joker's Millions was actually my own find. Point is, when looking at this episode is when I read that Bruce Timm himself considers this to be one of the worst episodes of the entire DCAU. This might sound familiar. He said the terrible trio from the last season was the absolute worst. This time, I wasn't really content with just wondering. I wanted to know where this info came from. Evidently, he used to interact with the fans on the forums. I mean, maybe he still does. I'm not really into forums anymore. But on the subject of the worst episodes, Batman in My Basement was brought up, and he said that he regrets having anything to do with Prophecy of Doom, and to that, I don't blame him. I'm not sure which of these two is worse, to be honest. However, his bottom five episodes is a lot of content I disagree with, since I didn't mind Terrible Trio, and I thought Cat Scratch Fever was an enjoyable story. I would have to see it again, but I remember the STAS episode Heavy Metal being pretty good. Can't defend Superman's pal, though, but hey, that's the nature of opinions. Like how some bear the opinion that BTAS is the best DCAU show. So after that lengthy explanation, what do I think of Animal Act? The episode opens with Batman and Robin watching the city from a rooftop until Nightwing arrives as he and Batman throw shade at one another. Nightwing, what are you doing here? Oh, just following a pattern of obsessive behavior instilled in me at an early age. You should work on your stealth skills. I heard you coming halfway across the roof. Good to see you too. So that already sets the tension high between these two and we just started. A mystery man is seen climbing a radar tower and overpowers all three of them while getting away with a computer chip. This man was actually a gorilla. But Nightwing remembers this gorilla as one of the animals at his circus when he was a kid. So he takes Tim with him for a visit the next day. I like how we actually get to see more of the circus this time than in Robin's Reckoning, which was more about the tragic backstory. Like the scene with the big guy, or the part where they see a woman spinning on a wheel as her partner has to throw axes in an attempt not to hit her. But of course, they're doing it without giving a second thought. Then we're introduced to Miranda Kane, the animal tamer and childhood friend of Dick. Clearly the gorilla is the same one as the other night, so you're probably expecting her to have been the one to cause the robberies the other night. Batman clearly thought the same way as me, with Nightwing refusing to believe it. This is actually my favorite scene in the whole episode. Take a look. You could knock. I did a little computer tracking of the Haley Circus Tour for the last six months. Seems that each town the circus played in was visited by a series of inexplicable robberies. Electronic items, like chips, micro-tools, circuitry. There's no way Miranda had anything to do with these robberies. She had the time, experience, and access to train the gorilla. I know her. You knew her, a lifetime ago. Actually, it's one of my favorite scenes so far. It was so awkward. Batman is soullessly telling Dick that his friend from childhood has got to be a criminal mastermind and then just bluntly says, You knew her a, a lifetime, lifetime ago. ago. 
Technically, Batman's not wrong in this case, but he just comes off like such an ass. Not to mention how he's in the shadows for this entire scene. Going back to earlier in the episode, Dick had a line about the circus being a great place to grow up. I really wouldn't be surprised if he wished he just never met Bruce or had anything to do with crime fighting at this point. After that brief bit of dialogue, there's also a really long shot of the two just staring at each other with nothing but the sound of the wind, going to show just how unpleasant this encounter truly is. What? Computer just picked up a silent alarm at the Sharp Alert Car Locator Factory. That's only 10 blocks away. Two bears are attacking a car repair shop, and for the last few episodes, I have been skipping over a lot of action scenes since they didn't really leave an impact on me, or they just padded out the runtime. Here, I like how unrehearsed this one feels. Both Batman and Nightwing are trying different strategies on the fly, like trying the direct approach, using the rising and lowering platforms to stop the one bear, or Batman using the water to slow it down as Nightwing rams into it with the forklift. Earlier, Nightwing kicked a barrel at one of the bears, and it just starts riding the barrel, confirming that it's gotta be from the circus. Batman and Nightwing review the footage and see that the bears were far too precise in this robbery, and that means something sinister is up. The scene then cuts to this clown taking the control chips off of said bears. This clown has been seen in the background several times in this episode, once when Dick and Tim were exploring the circus, the other when Bullock conducted his own investigation. Okay, Mr. Happy, off the car. He kind of looks like the Mad Hatter, but you probably wouldn't be thinking of him specifically. Now that the mind control is a factor, you know he's behind it. The climax isn't anything out of the ordinary, though. Hatter has everyone controlled as they fight Batman and Nightwing. I mean, we already had the exact same climax in Season 1's Mad as a Hatter, only it was just Batman that time. So this scene leaves me pretty bored, to be honest. But it picks up once Jarvis' hat is destroyed. I hate having to resort to such a base, pedestrian form of violence, but you leave me no choice. I don't know, I just enjoy his voice acting, as well as his manner of speaking. It can just make basic lines like that entertaining. Leading to a comedic ending as Tim's gonna spend the next week at the circus, cleaning up poop. As a whole though, this episode was really good in my honest opinion. Action scenes were well done, voice acting was great, the Mad Hatter was always a good villain in BTAS and continues I hear. But I think the main takeaway from this episode was not any of that circus Mad Hatter stuff. What is truly important is the thing I have been hyping up the most in this review. The tension between Bruce Wayne and Dick Grayson is at an all-time high. No more waiting. By this point, we all want to know what on earth happened between Bruce and Dick that made him leave Bruce, quit being Robin, and have Batgirl take his place as the primary sidekick until Tim arrived on the scene. Well, folks, the mysteries behind the fourth season of BTAS are finally going to be revealed. I've been looking forward to reviewing this episode since the very beginning of BTAS Season 1. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for Episode 17, Old Wounds. The plot begins in the present as Robin's fighting off some goons with the help of Nightwing. You sound just like Batman. I'm nothing like him. Yeah, right. The mask, the attitude, the long underwear. Drop it. I'd love to know what happened between you two. Things change. No kidding. You guys used to be the greatest, Batman and Robin, the dynamic duo. Maybe you should ask him. I did. And you'll never guess what he said. Things change. Not wanting to even be compared to Batman, Dick opens up about what really happened. Remember back to season two. There was a line drawn in the sand between these two in the present storyline of Robin's Reckoning, but they hashed it out at the end. Throughout season three and Sub-Zero, there weren't many issues other than that one time in House and Garden where Dick's friend left annoyed that he had to talk to Bruce. Things started going downhill at his college graduation, which is where the flashback begin. Also, keep in mind, for the remainder of this flashback, when I say Robin, I'm referring to Dick Grayson and not Tim Drake. After the flashback, I'll go back to referring to Dick as Nightwing when he's in costume, and Tim Drake as Robin. As for the story, Dick is receiving his degree with the highest honors in the entire class, as Barbara and Alfred are watching. And Bruce is not in attendance here. Barbara obviously comments on this in shock since remember that we're back in the BTAS era, meaning that she doesn't know that Bruce and Dick are Batman and Robin. So where is Bruce right now? Obviously he's Batman patrolling the streets, stopping a guy who's driving too fast. I thought being Batman at all instead of being at his adopted son's graduation was sinful enough, but recently I started listening to a podcast called Arkham Sessions, ran by Dr. Andrea Litamendi and Brian Ward as they analyze the psychology behind these BTAS episodes. If you're interested, I would recommend it. Amongst all the great commentary on this episode in particular, the point that stood out to me the most that I hadn't even considered is what Batman is doing as opposed to being at the graduation, not just the fact that he is not there. 
Batman is stopping someone who is speeding and running red lights. Riddler didn't threaten to blow up the city with a missile or anything, just a guy violating the traffic laws. Something the GCPD can certainly handle. Of course, this guy gives Batman the lead on the case he's working, but he's Batman. Can it not wait? So now it's obvious that Bruce just plainly doesn't want to attend, which is just crazy. He's also not going to let Dick enjoy the night, since while he's celebrating with Barbara, Bruce calls demanding that he comes to his location immediately. It's already plainly obvious why Nightwing would be bitter against Bruce, since he didn't even care enough to go to the graduation, or won't even let Dick enjoy it while it lasts, as he coldly remarks, I'm not making the schedule. Now, Dick has to leave Barbara behind with his crappy excuse. Sorry. I just remembered, I promised the guys at the dorm I'd help them clean out the fridge. Uh, catch you later. He must be realizing now that if he continues on this path, he will be doing this forever. Not doing what he wants, but always leaving early or canceling on his friends. Well, for what? The guy who before treated him like a kid if it was convenient for the situation? Oh wait, did I say before? I mean right freaking now. Robin shows up and Batman only responds with, You're late. Excuse me for having a life. Like, what? At this point, I have absolutely no idea what's going on through Batman's mind, and trust me, I will get more into that as we go. To provide some basic conflict, the flashback is framed around the latest scheme of the Joker. He's great in this episode, but his part of the storyline is definitely not worthy of much analysis since it's merely the subplot. But hey, you couldn't have picked a better villain for the job. Honestly, must I do everything myself? Batman and Robin fail to stop the Joker, but one of his new thugs gets left behind and is subsequently chased by Batman and Robin. Honestly guys, I have a really hard time watching this scene, let alone describing it. I'll save you, Daddy. Stay back. The music is a bit cliche, but we have to talk about Batman here. Where's the Joker? I I don't know. Daddy! Remember now? Robin instantly felt bad about this whole thing the moment he saw Connor's wife and especially his son. Batman, not like this. Not in front of his family. The sooner he talks, the sooner we leave. Who would not be able to understand why Batman and Robin would be harassing his father at such a young age? In season one, I noticed how protective Batman was over children in the meh episode The Underdwellers and the pretty good see no evil. It made sense given his childhood trauma, and so he wouldn't want other children to experience trauma under his watch, but here, he doesn't care, he just wants to know where Joker is and is banging this man's head to the wall as this kid's crying in the background. How can you justify this? Batman has resources. He could have remembered where the house was and gone after Connor when he was alone or something. I don't think there's a single good reason to be doing this, and thankfully, Robin agrees with me. I'm out of here now. This really is one of the darkest moments in BTAS. Maybe it wouldn't seem so at first, but it has a lot of darker undertones to it. Batman simply doesn't care about how his actions are traumatizing a little kid, or how he's basically beating the crap out of this man and forcing him to confess to taking bribes from the Joker in front of his whole family. He doesn't even care that Robin thinks they're going too far. Robin leaving is what makes him stop, or at least I hope anyway, since that's when it cuts to commercial break. Point is, why did it take all of those things for Batman to feel remorse? It's absolutely unacceptable behavior from him, in addition to the graduation drama from earlier. Dick then goes to Barbara's place and almost reveals that he's Robin, but leaves right away. Feeling concerned, she takes it to Bruce, and then he reveals that they're Batman and Robin, also revealing that he knows that she's Batgirl, and this possibly dates back to Shadow of the Bat even. He never told either of these two lovers this fact before now, and I don't know why. Once again, this takes place before Batgirl's been considered part of the team, therefore she doesn't have the training to survive like Bruce and Dick. He has known who she was, but never took her in or told her father or anything like that before. That just seems... weird. I don't know. Thankfully, Joker threatens the people over the TV, and this lightens my mood by quite a bit. So, if you want to avoid unhappy landings, just send $40 million to me, the Joker. That's $40 million. Operators are standing by. And remember, don't send it airmail. <laughs> Following a brief scene, the Joker just hits Batgirl off the roof. Uh, for real this time. Actually, maybe that explains how Scarecrow killed her in her own nightmare. But that's neither here nor there. Robin catches her, and then the three of them finish off the Joker. 
This is a tough scene to analyze, guys. But Batgirl and Robin have a quick argument about keeping secrets that you probably saw coming. But when she mentions that Bruce knew about this already, Dick's anger completely shifts to him. It wasn't my place to tell you. But it was your place to put her in danger. It wasn't like that. I volunteered. You think you did? You don't know him like I do. He manipulates, pulls strings, anything to get what he wants. I thought we had the same goals. Things change. I changed. The game's over, Batman. I quit. What did I just watch? Batman, what the hell kind of reaction was that? Tell you what it was, it was mad. I have been building up to this for the entire review, and this is going to be a hot take, so let me just say it now. I feel as if Batman's been growing more and more unstable as time has gone on, and this episode perfectly embodies this. Remember how Batman didn't even try to consult Tim Drake about his father leaving? Remember how he coldly laid out the rules for Tim as opposed to having fun with it? How about the time where Batman hit the freeze gun in the direction of the hench girl in front of him and froze her leg with no concern? I didn't even talk about it during Cold Comfort, but listen to this line he gave to Batgirl during training. Dead is dead. He bluntly disregarded Tim's feelings about Annie and growing pains. And as Bruce Wayne, he couldn't even remember his own employee retiring, he couldn't remember his own date's name, and so on. I think the reason for this is, Batman has been dealing with some of these super criminals for years, and it has to have gotten to him mentally. Batman wasn't created to deal with the freaks he deals with now. Bruce created the Batman to deal with organized crime, mobsters, drugs, and so on. Ordinary people who just need something to be afraid of. And this is one of the conflicts of the Dark Knight. How can you deal with people who can't be, as Alfred put it, bought, bullied, or reasoned with? How many times can you see the Joker kill people with laughing gas, or see Clayface transform into another person, or a giant monster? Hell, I remember the time in Mudslide when Clayface literally put Batman inside of his clay skin to suffocate him. How many times can you be gassed by the Scarecrow into seeing your greatest fears before you start to go insane as well? I don't mean insane like the Joker, I mean he just doesn't react to anything here. Here's what's basically his own son screaming in his face about how he manipulates people and pulls strings, and the only face he can muster up is this blank, 20 yard stare. They do a close up on it as well, so it had to have been intentional. Remember back in Mask of the Phantasm when Andrea had given similar criticism to Bruce? Take a look. They had to pay! But Andy, what will vengeance solve? If anyone knows the answer to that, Bruce, it's you. The difference is night and day as he begged her to stop her rampage and the shock of being told they're the exact same thing. So clearly, he is capable of reciprocating the emotion that Robin's giving him right now, but for some reason, he's only standing there and says, I, I thought, thought we, we had, had the same goals. goals. So is he saying all of his absolutely terrible behavior was completely ignorant of how Robin felt? That is why I say this episode and this scene are a model for my theory on his character at this point. His mind is solely focused on the mission of Batman and nothing else. This was the straw that broke the camel's back for Robin. Robin, wait. I never put on that costume again. And you still haven't forgiven him? Back in the present day, the goons from earlier had stolen someone's wallet. Nightwing picks it up and can't believe the fact that it belongs to Connor, the guy from earlier. That sounds a bit contrived, but it turns out that Connor now works for Bruce as a security guard. Bruce even asks how his son is doing. So has Batman learned something without having to say so? Well, that's entirely up to you. My take on it is as follows. Bruce always wants people to reform. Remember, there was a whole arc about this in Season 3. He usually tries to help out as Bruce by offering a low-wage job and a low-rent apartment nearby. In the Arkham Sessions podcast, it was argued that Bruce possibly hadn't learned anything and instead is merely keeping an eye on Connor. I think he definitely is doing that, but at the same time, he does believe in reform. What about that hot take I just brought up? Well, I believe Bruce did learn something from Dick quitting. You see... This doesn't mean he's 100% back to the same way he was in previous seasons, 
Remember, I described Batman's behavior in the flashback as beyond unacceptable, which it was. I had not said that about him before this, though. Before, I was just commenting on being extra brutal in fight scenes, or being forgetful as Bruce Wayne, or how blunt he was with Tim. I was showing that he has lost a lot of his empathy, and that he's solely focused on his mission, but still, he was especially off the rails in the flashback. I think this was done on purpose to really show why Nightwing would quit and be bitter to this day. So yes, he is still showing signs that much of his sanity has gone, but Dick quitting was still a tiny wake-up call for him. But the question is, if Alfred and the Bat family can't bring him out of this, what possibly could? Well, that's something you'll have to keep in your mind since this subject will be revisited in my review of Justice League Season 2. Back to the episode, the ending to Old Wounds is very memorable as well. Robin has now gotten Nightwing to admit it. Things may never be the same between him and Bruce ever again, but maybe it is time to forgive. And I love how the new Robin is the one responsible for bringing the original Batman and Robin back together, and because of this, we get to hear the Adventures of Batman and Robin theme one last time as the curtains close on Old Wound. Speak of the devil. You coming? I guess it's about time. I don't know if it was obvious or not, but I love this episode. It was the exclamation point on Batman's character arc of empathy that I've talked about all season long. It finally answered all of our questions about how BTAS turned into TNBA and gave us a heartwarming ending showing that while Dick won't forget what happened, he can most certainly forgive. Yep, this has been the longest I've spent on any episode yet, so I think it's time to move on. Episode 18, The Demon Within. When going into this episode, I had bought into the hype that it was a terrible episode since most people feel that way. If you hadn't realized the pattern by now, I was pleasantly surprised when I found myself really interested in the plot. Bruce and Tim were at an auction, and one of the items is a magical branding iron that was used by Morgan Le Fay. A young boy named Clarion, who evidently is by himself, bids on it. Another man by the name of Jason Blood bids higher until Bruce steps in with the highest bid, giving the iron to blood since they know each other evidently. Clarion had once killed his own parents and now has access to all their resources, which includes magic. Many folks had their suspension of disbelief shattered at this moment, but to that I say magic was already in BTAS back in Zatanna's debut in BTAS V2. Also, we know that this world has Superman, the Flash, Aquaman, and the Green Lantern Corps in it. By this point, you should just expect more fantastical elements. This isn't BTAS V1 anymore. I also realized this episode is no different than Zatanna from Season 2 or Showdown from Season 3. Jason Blood can also transform into Etrigan the Demon since he was cursed with that several hundred years ago and that curse is how he's lived so long. Etrigan the Demon is another DC Comics character, and so we get an introduction to his lore via this TNBA episode. Anyway, Clarion steals the branding iron and uses it to separate Jason Blood and Etrigan which causes Jason to start dying from old age. So Batman tries to stop Clarion all the while avoiding Etrigan. Robin is clearly freaked out by this whole thing, which makes sense, but beyond that, this episode has magic and fight scenes, and that's about it. It's one of those episodes. You know, a quick setup, action scene, ending. In my opinion, this isn't a bad thing. I mean, we just had old wounds when it comes to analysis, so I'm glad we're getting a break for a few episodes. In the end, I like how Etrigan gives Clarion the greatest of punishments. What's that mean? I'm sending him to his room. I also enjoy Batman's line at the end to Robin. About tonight. Don't ask. Just don't ask. Etrigan will be back in the first season of Justice League where he'll aid Batman and company yet again as they actually do get to fight Morgan Le Fay and we learn Jason Blood's backstory. This episode mostly serves as an introduction to that lore. As it stands, I thought the animation was a breath of fresh air since we get to see lots of cool powers and the production value was high like usual. So yeah, pretty good episode. The Demon Within might be a pretty disliked episode, but now we have what is often considered to be one of the best episodes of the entire season, Legends of the Dark Knight. However, it is popular for a much different reason than, say, Heart of Ice. This really isn't a BTAS episode, and you'll quickly see why. The story is that a group of kids are wandering around Gotham at night talking about Batman. Since the show is obviously from Batman's perspective, we really don't think of how he's perceived by the public, but remember the episode I Am the Knight. 
Batman had stated that he became some kind of a tourist icon, more than a vigilante. These kids are in possession of all this Batman merchandise, so I just figured I'd mention this bit of continuity. Anyway, the three kids have different stories to tell in regards to what Batman is like. The second story is when things start to get interesting. The animation completely shifts to look like the Batman comics from the 1950s fully animated. The story itself is so clever since it's incredibly cheesy, but in a way that makes sense for that era. We got your clue about stealing laughter. The comedy is finished. A famous line from Pagliacci, the opera about a sad clown. It was your twisted way of saying you'd steal the original score. Now we're gonna make our own clown cry. Combined with the animation and the corny acting, the story feels incredibly authentic. Joker is one of the highlights of the 50s scene with some great faces and some good lines. Mother always said I had talent. Well, oh, oh yeah. yeah, that was right. good. Yeah, <laughs> that's enough. Nobody likes a brown nose. The scene is animated like a 70s cartoon, but it's funny how it's 10 times more violent than any of those since the censors were so strict back then. But speaking of censorship, another great detail is how Batman and Robin use their environment to their advantage in the fight with the goons. This is another classic censorship trope where the Ninja Turtles are never allowed to actually use their weapons for the longest time. Once that ends, we'll get a joke made about Joel freaking Schumacher, the director of the third and fourth Batman movies. I love Batman. All those muscles, the tight rubber armor, and that flashy car. I heard it can drive up walls. Yeah, sure, Joel. Those movies are so recent that I'm surprised they were allowed to make that joke. The final story is told from the girl's perspective. If you know your graphic novel, she may look familiar to you. She's meant to look like Carrie Kelly, who was the third Robin in Frank Miller's The Dark Knight Returns. It's funny to see that this team paid homage to that novel here when they would go on to do a direct adaptation 14 years later as a direct DVD movie. I vastly prefer the full movie to this, and the book itself, but that's neither here nor there. But of course, that movie being better than this little scene is to be expected since that's an adaptation and not just a tribute. I'm not gonna run through the plot since it's a scene from The Dark Knight Returns, but I can say this. They got Michael Ironside to voice old Batman and Kevin Michael Richardson to do the mutant leader, both very fitting voices for the characters. With that done, the kids find Firefly up to his old tricks as the one true Batman arrives to save the day, stop Firefly, and leave as mysteriously as ever, thus ending the episode. I feel like what makes this episode work so well is just how simple it is. By the time this episode had aired, Batman had been around for 59 years. The character had so many different incarnations and has continued that to this day. Nowadays, Batman is almost 80. This episode really spoke out to me and many others since I've been a Batman fan for my whole life and as a result I've seen a lot of different incarnations, but at the same time no matter which version it is, whether it be dark and depressing or lighthearted and campy, Batman has and always will stand for the same set of morals and will continue to do so, inspiring people of all ages for generations to come. Batman the Brave and the Bold was quite the campy series, but the series finale to that was such a joy to watch as Batman gives this speech. Yeah, it looks like. At least you can say you had a good run. A great run. And until we meet again, boys and girls, know that wherever evil lurks, in all its myriad forms, I'll be there with the hammers of justice to fight for decency and defend the innocent. He might have been cancelled, but a new Batman would just be created and take his place, whether it be on TV, in video games, on the big screen, or on the pages of the comic books. Batman will be around forever, and will always mean the same thing. Once again, not an episode with much to offer when it comes to storytelling, but it's just such a fun tribute to the variety of the Batman mythos, so I definitely don't mind. Next episode, Girls' Night Out. An episode so alien that Alec considers it the worst episode of BTAS. I wouldn't go that far, but let's take a look at it. A prisoner is being escorted from Metropolis to Gotham with the truck driver mocking her. The prisoner is Livewire, and I suppose that means you need to know who that is. Well, let's open up our copies of Superman the Animated Series Volume 1 and find out. Livewire was once an obnoxious, albeit popular, radio personality that frequently badmouthed Superman. She did a live show on stage in the middle of a thunderstorm that went a bit too far since she got fried by a bolt of lightning, and this was the accident that transformed her into Livewire. From there, she became a regular member of Superman's rogues gallery. Livewire had enough power left to escape captivity, and now she's ready to wreak havoc on Gotham. Batman is conveniently out of town, so he's giving Batgirl the task of stopping Livewire. But he says he'll call Superman to help out. However, he wasn't available to pick up the phone. Hello, Dozeville Central. Is Clark Kent there? No. May I ask who's calling? A friend. 
It's critical that he gets this message. Shoot. Live wire has escaped in Gotham. If he wants to get on top of the story, he needs to get there right away. Do you understand? Who is this? Sounds like a cape to me. I like how Batman just hung up there on the phone. It's kind of funny. Not that she needs much introduction, but in case you were curious, Supergirl debuted in Superman the Animated Series Volume 3 in the episode Little Girl Lost, where Superman was exploring the galaxy and found a sister planet of Krypton called Argo. In their final days, this family had put themselves in cryopreservation for someone to rescue them one day. Superman arrived too late to save the family, but their teenage daughter did survive, and so he took her in as his cousin. Whom then took up the mantle of Supergirl, aiding Superman in a quick confrontation against Darkseid. And I know I'm going on a bit of a tangent, but that's because I'm in the mood to talk about much more interesting episodes. Back to this one, though. Supergirl arrives in time to save Batgirl from Livewire, but before they can stop her, she gets away. Let's see here. Bullock is pissed that the rookies lost Livewire. The episode then cuts to Harley and Ivy's hideout, where they discuss trying to keep a low profile so Batman won't find them. Livewire arrives and offers an edge, and the lady to go out for a crime spree. Now that the time has come, I'll give credit to Harley Quinn in this episode. I mean, she was treated like a complete joke, and I love it. This even carries over to the big fight scene at the end, where Harley tries to hit Supergirl in the head with a spring-loaded boxing glove. <laughs> the villains are my favorite part of this episode, honestly. So where do the heroes go wrong? Past Shadow of the Bat, I haven't had any issues with the DCAU Batgirl, and I'll say now that the DCAU Supergirl is a good character, but I'm not a big fan of how they use her in many of her appearances. The biggest problem with this episode is just how cringeworthy the interactions between these two are. Is it the script? The acting? I don't know, but when Batgirl is commenting on how cool it is to fly, I just want to turn the TV off. During fight scenes, I don't have too many issues, but it's just the dialogue. Speaking of fighting, Supergirl gets wrapped in Ivy's vines, no surprise there, the heroes have to re-strategize, and it's this scene that kills me. Your life is so cool. Yeah, well, so how about you? Well, I kinda live on a farm. A farm? Like chickens and cows and stuff? Yeah. What about it? Fresh air, early to bed, early to rise, none of this constant night work, no big city congestion, you are so lucky. I've got a lot of chores. Chores, man, I always wanted to have chores. Oh, God. I said the previous scene like this made me want to turn the TV off, however, a scene like this is actively embarrassing, as I feel every word piercing through my eardrums like nails on a chalkboard. Chores? I've always wanted to do chores. Stop, stop. For the longest time, I was prepared to say this episode was clearly written by older men who have no idea how teenage girls talk to one another, and that's why this scene exists. I mean, it's not like I'm an expert in that field either, but I can tell you it's probably not like this. But no, I checked the DCAU wiki and this episode was written by a woman. An older woman, but nevertheless still a woman. So when she was a teenager, was this regular conversation? Probably not. It's just bad and cringy dialogue. I think I've spent too long on this scene as it is, so let's wrap it up. Thanks to the true power of teamwork, Batgirl and Supergirl managed to gain the upper hand since the villains lack said teamwork. The villains are incarcerated, the day is saved, and even Bullock has to give the duo some credit, ending Girls' Night Out. I don't have much to say about this one overall. I like the characters involved, and it establishes another bond within the DCAU, of which we will see many going forward. The cringy dialogue is definitely an issue, but it's not a terrible episode. Not many animation mistakes or contrivances, so when thinking of the best and worst of TNBA, this isn't going to be one I think of in either category. But hey, speaking of the best of TNBA, I have a hard time picking my favorite episode. I just raved about all the wounds, and right alongside it is another one of the most critically acclaimed episodes in the DCAU. I don't disagree with the majority one bit here. It's now time to talk about Mad Love. I know the last few episodes after Old Wounds have been pretty lax, but Mad Love is an episode filled with serious emotions and dark implications. I'm saying this right now to get anyone who isn't familiar with this story in the right mindset before we begin. Actually, before we start, there is one thing I'd like to go over. Harley Quinn made her worldwide debut in the BTAS V1 episode, The Joker's Favor. Her role in the story was someone who cheered Joker's antics on. Not much to it. But it added an extra spice to Joker episodes that was missing from earlier episodes like Christmas with the Joker or The Last Laugh. She continued aiding the Joker in The Laughing Fish, which was more or less the same as Joker's favor, you know, the wacky sidekick. Cheer up! You can be my very own little mermaid. Sick, you know that boss. Hmm. But then we get to the man who killed Batman. And trust me, I've been thinking of this ever since I wrote the season two review last summer. Nothing was too out of place in that episode until this happened. I said put them back! 
The question then became, what is the true nature of the Harley-Joker relationship, with the imagery from Harley and Ivy continuing to support this? Thus leading us into Season 3. In Trial, we heard that Harley was once a psychologist in Arkham, and that was when she met the Joker. Finally, in the episode Harley Quinnade, Batman in genuine confusion said the following. What's the attraction, Quinn? This sick infatuation with the Joker. Look, Bats, when I was a doctor, I was always listening to other people's problems. Then I met Mr. J, who listened to me for a change and made everything fun. <laughs> you think it's funny when he hurts people? It's just a joke. Hope you're still laughing when it's your turn. So the stage has now been set. It is time to learn about the twisted story that turned the promising Dr. Harley and Quinzel into the psychotic Harley Quinn. It's time to start Bad Love. What the heck? My software just isn't working today. I don't mind saying I really hate these checkups. What in this miserable world is more beautiful than a nice big smile? <laughs> It was an easy hint, Joker. Sloppy. Predictable. May the floss be with you! <laughs> I really hate these checkups. In all seriousness, I just thought it was funny how I made that parody out of one of the darkest episodes. Anyway, let's get started. Gordon arrives for his physical, but the Joker and Harley Quinn are there instead. Luckily, Batman arrives in the nick of time to save Gordon before Joker can do anything. The dialogue in this scene is just fantastic. All of Joker's dentist puns, his laughs, Batman dropping the truth bomb on Joker about how corny the setup was, and then there are the little things, like how when Harley tries to tell a joke, the Joker just gets pissed off, thus foreshadowing the climax. This scene is just a setup for the real story, and as a result there isn't much else to say, but Gordon's ending line is a perfect way to end a parody. So now that the intro is done, there's no better time to mention the fact that similar to Holiday Nights, yeah I remember that episode, Mad Love was also based on an issue of the Batman Adventures, an issue that went by the same name written by Bruce Timm and Paul Dini themselves in the year 1994, the same year that both Trial and Harley Quinnade hit the air. Holiday Nights as an episode was the definitive way to experience that story, but there are many people who actually prefer the Mad Love comic to the episode. Ignoring the stupid, the comic is better because it has the BTAS designs crap, which I know I don't say that sort of thing often, but the lines are almost identical and they are voiced by Mark Hamill himself. If the Joker design really lessens the quality of this episode, cry me a river. Since the episode's only 22 minutes, some scenes were altered or left out. Nothing that has a huge impact was cut out, but just some little things I would like to highlight as we go along. Warner Brothers has provided a motion comic version on one of their YouTube channels. I have no idea who these impersonators they got to voice on are, but still, it's not hard to find. Back to the story, Joker's trying to think of a new plan, but Harley continues to interrupt in an attempt to make love. I really like the script in this scene. I don't usually highlight that specifically, but the words that Joker uses, as well as Mark Hamill's amazing performance, make this a standout scene. We also answer the question you've probably been wondering the whole time. I mean, you'll watch Adam West's Batman and see all the contrived and absolutely ridiculous death traps that the villains put together for Batman, and you'll wonder why they don't just shoot him. Why don't you just shoot him? Just shoot him? Know this, my sweet. The death of Batman must be nothing less than a masterpiece. The triumph of my sheer comic genius over his Ow! ridiculous mask and gadgets. Oh my god. You can just feel the intensity in the air as this scene goes on. Back on subject, Joker tosses out an old plan involving a piranha tank, but Harley picks it up, not before being kicked out. As usual, Harley thinks Batman is to blame for her current situation and not the guy who pretends to love her despite tossing her out the door multiple times. The next few minutes are solely spent on a flashback as Harley remembers the time she first met the Joker in Arkham after she became a doctor. One detail that was in the comic but not in the episode was the fact that Harley didn't even get through school legitimately. They don't say it, but basically she used sex to get the highest grades possible and that is how she became a doctor. Her next move was to get into Arkham, get the secrets of those super criminals, and to profit off of them. The stuff about profiting off of these maniacs was in the episode, but not that stuff about school. I would have liked it if it was in the episode because it shows how twisted her moral compass was before being taken in by Joker, which makes her doing terrible things by his side all the more believable. 
There are lots of nods to the Joker's history throughout the show and the episode. Like when Dr. Leland and Harleen are walking throughout the hall, the Joker begins to hum his classic theme from BTAS. What is interesting is that on your first time viewing, there isn't too much to say about this flashback as you're watching it. The reason will become clear later, trust me. So anyway, Joker somehow leaves his cell and puts a note in Harleen's office. Three months later, she finally gets a session with him. She thought she was ready for anything until this happened. You know, my father used to beat me up pretty badly. Anything except that. Every time I got out of line, BAM! Or sometimes I'd be just sitting there doing nothing. POW! Pops tended to favor the grape, you see. Uh-huh. There was only one time I ever saw Dad really happy. He took me to the circus when I was seven. One of the things that makes this scene incredibly ominous is that we really don't know if he's telling the truth or not. In my season 1 review, I had praised the fact that the show never gave us the origin of, say, Batman or Joker. BTAS, as I've said a million times, was a tie-in to Batman 89, a film about that very thing, that obviously was fresh in people's minds. So instead, we got stories about the Man Bad or the Mad Hatter. It wasn't until Mask of the Phantasm that we learned that Joker once worked for the Valestra mob and was responsible for the assassination of Carl Beaumont, which had inspired Andrea to become the Phantasm, so his history is not that clear as we already know. But who is to say that this story about his father never happened? Maybe this was why the Joker became a mobster. Oh, I still remember the clowns running around, dropping their pants. <laughs> <laughs> My old man laughed so hard, I thought he'd bust a gut. So the very next night, I ran out to meet him with his best Sunday pants around my ankles. Hi, Dad! Look at me! Zoop! I took a big pratfall and tore the crotch clean out of his pants! <laughs> Of comedy. You're always taking shots from folks who just don't get the joke. Most importantly, Harleen was devastated by the story Joker told. The next scene establishes the fact that she's piecing his story together and has come to the conclusion that he is just a bit misguided in his attempt to spread joy. Joker was just kidding with his father and then was punched in the face for it. That was what told him that violence was, as he put it, the downside of comedy. However, the episode is missing a thing from the comic that really drove it home. In Harleen's notes, you can clearly see how it says, Be in when prank gone wrong, and right under it, it says, Three days in hospital. In the comic, the story he tells Harleen is mostly the same. The difference is that the end, he says, I still like to think it was aiming for my fanny and missed. Or at least, that's what I told myself when I woke up in the hospital three days later. This extra knife in the wound would have sold the tragic side of Harleen's turn, if you ask me. If you want to see just how far her faith in Joker had gone, give this a watch. It soon became clear to me that the Joker, so often described as a raving homicidal madman, was actually a tortured soul crying out for love and acceptance. A lost, injured child trying to make the world laugh at his antics. And there, as always, was the self-righteous Batman. Determined to make life miserable for my angel. Yes, I admit it. As unprofessional as it sounds, I had fallen in love with my patient. Pretty crazy, huh? Not at all. As a dedicated, career-oriented young woman, you felt the need to abstain from all amusement and fun. It's only natural you'd be attracted to a man who could make you laugh again. I knew you'd understand. Anytime. After that, we get a scene of Joker being returned to Arkham following an escape attempt. Harleen was obviously devastated, and her monologue about him being alone and frightened as Batman drags a wounded Joker through the halls shows what exactly Harleen thinks of all this. That is her perspective. This is what she thinks Batman is doing. With this being the final nail that transforms Dr. Harleen Quinzel into Harley Quinn. Say hello to your new improved Harley Quinn! In the present day, Harley has cooked up a devastating plan. She pulls off an incredibly convincing performance as she begs Batman to meet with her. After showing him these fake plans, a Joker robot shows up and attacks the two. Normally, this is something I would cut as worthless summary fodder, however, I figured I'd just mention it to show off some DCAU lore. 
You might be wondering, since when did Joker have robots of himself? Well, this actually isn't new. Go back to Joker's debut episode, Christmas with the Joker, and you'll see that he has several robots ready to fire at Robin. Like I've said before, the Joker is a genius for all the wrong reasons. With the amount of time that's passed since Christmas with the Joker, it's safe to assume the design is improved enough for it to hold a gun and be programmed to save full sentences. After all, improving tech has been a theme this whole season. Sweet dreams, sucker. Okay, so now Harley has captured Batman and she's using the tossed out piranha plan from earlier. Joker tossed it out because of the fact that the piranhas would never smile, so Harley has hung Batman upside down so the frowns would be smiles. Okay, we're finally done with the big summary dump. Seriously, this episode is filled to the brim with plot points to get us from point A to point B, despite being a mere 22 minutes. But now we've finally reached the big moment for this episode. Harley reveals that she's finally going to kill Batman so that she and Joker can move on from Batman, settle down, and live together forever. This statement is the catalyst for one of the eeriest moments in the history of BTAS. I mean, there have been many contenders, but this one manages to be something we've never seen before. Not once. Have a look. You and the Joker? Right a Rooney! <laughs> I've never seen you laugh before. I don't think I like it. Cut it out! You give me the creeps! Hats off to you, Mr. Conroy, for that one. Batman is literally laughing in Harley's face because she thinks that the Joker is in love with her. Remember what happened to Harley Quinnade? Batman was honestly curious why she was obsessed with him. But now we have the blunt Batman paired with the knowledge of Harley thinking that her future is with the Joker. Batman just plainly says it. Wake up, Harleen. He had you pegged for hired help the minute you walked into Arkham. I'm with you on this one, Batman. What the hell, Harley? It's just so beyond hard to believe that it's gotten to this point after everything that's happened. It's quite frankly insane. Yes, I do think Harley deserves some blame in this. She's been a willing accomplice to a criminal and has hurt countless people because she thinks it's all fun and games? Ridiculous! But at the same time, I understand how knowing Joker's tragic backstory that makes him think it's all fun and games will be so captivating to her. But now, Batman drops the ultimate truth bomb. He told me things, secret things he never told anyone! Was it his line about the abusive father? Or the one about the runaway mom? He's gained a lot of sympathy with that one. Stop it! You're making me confused! What was it he told that one parole officer? Oh yes. There was only one time I ever saw Dad really happy. He took me to the ice show when I was seven. Circus. He said it was the circus. He's got a million of them, Harley. You're wrong! My foot does love me! He does! Oh my god! I have no words! Can you believe this was aired on a Saturday morning TV show? This is insane! Think for a second, what is the one Batman incarnation that I've constantly compared this one to? Roll the clip. Well, you look nervous. Is it the scars? You wanna know how I got them? Yeah, the Dark Knight had used this similar idea for the famous, you wanna know how I got these scars line. Like, I can't emphasize just how scary an implication this is. So instead of doing that, let's go all the way back to the flashback and reevaluate it. The flashback was told through the eyes of Harley, and so we had no reason not to believe her. Knowing what Batman said, let's see how it plays out. Dr. Leland and Harley are walking through the hall talking about her motive to profit off the super criminals, to which Joker then hums his theme and winks at her. We also get the brief bit of dialogue outside of the cell. Care to tell me how this got in my office? I put it there. I think the guards would be interested to know you've been out of your cell. If you really were going to tell, you already would have. You know, sweets, I like what I've heard about you, especially the name, Harley Quinzel. Rework it a bit, and you get Harley Quinn. Like the clown character Harlequin, I know. I've heard it before. It's a name that puts a smile on my face. It makes me feel there's someone here I can relate to. Someone who might like to hear my secrets. The first session is the real point of contention, though. I've described Joker as a genius on numerous occasions, and this scene is the pinnacle of that. He planned this all so carefully, 
right down to the word choices and the type of story he tells. He analyzes these doctors and parole officers and comes up with whatever story would twist them to his side the best. Like Batman said, he has told tales about a runaway mom, the abandoned orphan story, the abusive father, even reusing some stories with a few details changed. Combined with Harley's shady past, these two made for a dangerous combo from the very beginning. Remember what Joker said at the end of his story he told to Harley? But hey, that's the downside of comedy. They're always taking shots from folks who just don't get the joke. Like my dad. Or Batman. I'm sure he always ends his stories with some kind of anecdote about how bad Batman is, since this will further drive people towards his side when they see Batman beating the Joker down for the monster he actually is. This is why the Joker is easily the scariest villain in the entire DCAU. We have seen the likes of the Scarecrow, the Phantasm, or Bane. We'll see other heinous villains like Lex Luthor or Darkseid and so on. But this bit of human manipulation, combined with the clown look to take people's guard down, the robots, the laughing gas, and some of the vile acts that we will see from him going forward are all reasons to believe why the Joker is the scariest villain. There is just one detail from the flashback I want to discuss. Remember the ending where Harley breaks Joker out as they make a dramatic exit? That laugh, I mean, was he laughing at Harley? Batman must be right, he did have her pegged for hired help since the beginning. He's probably thinking, I can't believe this idiot would just give him everything over some fake story. This is just tragic. But there isn't much left to the story, so let's get through it. Harley's about to kill Batman to win Joker's heart, despite what Batman has said, but Batman cleverly stops her by saying that he won't believe it for a second without a dead body. There is precedent for this. Remember the man who killed Batman? Joker didn't believe Sid the Squid for that very reason, and Batman was watching that whole thing. So Harley calls the Joker, and now there's just, for lack of a better phrase, a creepy vibe after that last scene. What? Harley? Oh, where the heck have you been? Hmm? Oh, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Batman, eh? No, oh, you don't say. You're... You have who tied up where? On the drive there, the comic provided a panel showing why the Joker would be pissed off at this. As the faces of Two-Face, Riddler, and Penguin mock the Joker for being the boyfriend of the girl who killed Batman after he failed so many times. This would have helped the episode as well, but they probably didn't feel like paying actors to say a few sentences. All throughout the video, I have talked about Lesson Censors this, Lesson Censors that, and man, I think this scene is the definition of that. I'll be just a minute. But Puddin, I, I don't understand. Don't you want to finally get rid of Batman? Only if I do it, idiot. But it's still your plan, see? Everything just like you said. Except I hung the guy upside down so he'd see their little frowns as little smiles. Now it all works. Except you have to explain it to me. If you have to explain a joke, there is no joke. <sighs> now I'll calm down, Puddin. You've forgotten what I told you a long time ago. One of the painful truths of comedy. You always take shots from folks who just don't get the joke. <laughs> and don't call me Puddin'. There you have it. That was the climax of the episode. So let's see how this plays out. Joker is about to just walk out on Batman, but in an act of utter hypocrisy, he decides it's time to just shoot Batman in the head. But remember how mad he got when Harley dared to tell him that? It's just so shocking. I don't know what else to say. Batman and Joker have a brief chase which ends as the two stand on a moving train, and Batman gives one final monologue for the episode. She almost had me, you know. Arms and legs chained, dizzy from the blood rushing to my head. I had no way out other than convincing her to call you. I knew your massive ego would never allow anyone else the honor of killing me. Though I have to admit she came a lot closer than you ever did. Puddin. 
Calling him Puddin' at the end really adds to the intensity, since this is easily one of the most brutal fight scenes between Batman and Joker that we will see. Not only is the train a perilous set piece, but Joker is legitimately getting hard-hitting shots in on Batman. We've never seen that. It's usually some hit him while he wasn't looking attack. But he made one fatal slip up. <laughs> We then cut to Harley, severely injured as she goes back to her cell at Arkham, finally acknowledging the Joker for what he is. I finally see that slime for what he is. A murderous, manipulative, irredeemable... Angel! Until then, you might be thinking I'd complain, but I'm not gonna. Does this undermine the whole episode? No, it actually doesn't, even though in concept it seems like it might. The obvious reason they did that was to make sure they could bring Harley back, but above all else, this episode was about how the Joker's influence had an irreversible effect on Harley. She's madly in love with this man, and since he told her to get better soon, suddenly he's instantly redeemed in her eyes. It's quite sad if I'm honest. Thing is, we can get into this in later videos, but for right now, I think that's enough. But we did it guys! We fully reviewed Mad Love! Honestly, I have no objections to this being the most popular TNBA episode. It makes perfect sense! This was such an epic and ambitious episode. I gave you guys the build up to this before diving into the episode proper, but you don't even need that. This is such a complete story as is. It has three acts, a tragic storyline, and an intense climax. If you ever needed a model for how to do a serious BTAS episode, this is your model. I think this is easily one of the best episodes of the entire series for just how well written it was. After analyzing both, I think this episode has the slight edge to old wounds. Not that I had many issues with that storyline, but still, this episode is flawless. I can't think of a noticeable animation error, the voice acting gives the story the respect it deserves. I mean, what more can I tell you? This is the longest I've spent on any episode yet. I think I'm finally ready to move on from this one though. Just keep this in mind. This is the longest I've spent on any episode, but I doubt Mad Love will keep that title for long. Trust me. The DCAU is really just getting started. Anyway, we have three episodes left this season, and none of them are too complex. So let's get right into episode 22, Chemistry. I was surprised right from the very beginning of this episode, since it starts out with yet another Veronica Vreeland party. But this time, she's getting married? She seemed like somebody who had marriage as a distant premonition. So let's see what happens. At this wedding, Bruce has a fateful encounter with one of the bridesmaids, Susan McGuire. Instantaneously, the two hit it off, with Batman's game being really messed up once he and Robin go out on patrol. You might be thinking that this is a really cliche plot that makes absolutely no sense for this version of Batman, and to that, I'd have to agree. We can talk about that in a bit. This episode does have some good lines in it as well, like when Robin says that Batman's acting strange and Alfred replies with, With him, how does one tell? But Bruce now stops everything and asks this woman to marry him? What the hell's going on here? These two met maybe two days ago and Bruce is completely enamored with her? Looks like that thing I promised a while ago has come true. We all know the Batman story and it's been played out in the series before, but Mask of the Phantasm threw a wrench in that. We saw that Bruce fell in love with his kindred spirit Andrea Beaumont and when she was taken away from him due to the mob, it was then that became Batman once and for all. That scene still pulls on my heartstrings to this day. I mean, I can't play it because of YouTube copyright, but still. Point in all this is, Bruce Wayne died at 8 years old, as we all know, but his love for Andrea had brought Bruce Wayne back. However, when she left, Bruce Wayne was permanently retired, and in his place, Batman was finally born. From that point forward, I don't think this version of Bruce should be seeing anyone. Not seriously, I mean. Go out with some stupid girl every now and again to keep cover, and remember her damn name this time. So basically, this story has already raised some red flags for me. Speaking of that famous Phantasm scene, they play that music as Bruce announces this to Tim, Barbara, and Dick. There's just one problem. That. How are you gonna keep it from her? I won't have to. I've always assumed that sooner or later the three of you would get all this. Well, it's gonna be sooner. They cut the music off in the middle, but still. Also, it's funny how he said they were gonna inherit this. Yeah, that didn't go as planned, did it? Oh, by the way, he also mentions that it's been a few weeks, so still too quick for marriage for my liking, but a little better than two days, I guess. So Bruce is getting married, with Dick telling Barbara that he'll probably be back in the costume within three months. Susan tells Lucius about the honeymoon plans that she made, and it was at this moment that I noticed Veronica wasn't at this party. 
when you'd think she'd be all over this. I mean, like, Leslie Tompkins is here, Kirk Langstrom is here, etc. But then Alfred butts in, saying that she's now on the phone, and she tells Bruce that her husband is acting strange. Bruce decides that he has to save her, and Susan lets him go. Dang, Nabbit, I really need something to finally end this summary. You won't mind? She's your friend. Wait, what? Susan literally says... She's your friend. Susan nonchalantly lets Bruce leave their wedding to save Veronica, adding to her supposed perfect understanding. But isn't she supposed to be friends with Veronica too? They met at her wedding, did they not? It was actually at this point that I changed my notes to get rid of the points off for this contrived relationship. Something's up here. After Bruce saves Veronica, he really shows how good he is at deception since he knows Michael's up to no good, but he's not going to reveal his cards just yet. Any idea why she called me? Some sort of problem? Problem? No, everything was fine. Well, that's another mystery then. Another? The investigators think the fire was arson. Someone's trying to kill her? Maybe. But they're not going to. I've hired some security guards to keep an eye on her. It turns out that Veronica was skeptical of Michael because he's actually half plant. Poison Ivy's back in her only solo episode this season. I've said it numerous times that TNBA has shown an increase in technology but there actually is no better example than this. Remember back to the season three episode, House and Garden. Ivy had wanted to create life so she was incapable of doing it herself. However, she needed Carlisle's DNA and body to do so, resulting in babies that became boys, then became men, and finally monsters, all this taking place over the course of a few days. So clearly there was room for improvement there. Ivy's chemistry skills have hit an all time high as she can now create life that still doesn't last forever but it can be whomever she pleases, all the while sending them out with pheromones to attract these billionaires. The billionaires would be so shallow as to actually fall for this, and then the clone would produce exactly the kind of person the billionaire would want. Get married, and once that's all done, the billionaire would be killed, the money would go to the clone, and then to Ivy. It's a dastardly plan, but I'm not a fan of how it hinges on people with no identity getting married, though. That part of it seems like it would be a tough sell, but maybe Ivy gave them a fake ID, I don't know. Point is, it's a little contrived, but it's still interesting, I guess. Looking at it again, this is actually super contrived. I don't know how this plot works and is an entertaining episode, but regardless, I still do enjoy the episode, despite the fact that it is really contrived. I don't know, I didn't really have a hard time buying it, but you might. We know that Susan had set up a cruise honeymoon with, quote, other newlyweds, but needless to say, this is the part of the plan where all the billionaires die. Batgirl and Robin arrive to save the day using the formula earlier in the story that kills these fake people. As the ship goes in flames, the final shot is Batman seeing Susan one last time before she sinks to the bottom of the ocean. Also, Ivy dies in the end too. I think she's back in a Static Shock episode? I could be wrong. At this point in the review, I was gonna give a bit of a sad theory towards, uh... Ivy's character in this particular episode and this whole season as a matter of fact but for time's sake and for the fact that I don't think it really adds anything since I don't really get any conclusive results out of it I decided to cut this one out of the video it'll be uh, at the end of the credits in the complete version of the review if you watch that so yeah let's get on with it other than that I don't have much else to say about chemistry it was a pretty good story a sad ending with some very interesting twists like the part where Michael puts his head through Veronica's laser fence. I genuinely thought that was a tense moment. Also, this is the very last time that Veronica Vreeland appears, so say goodbye to her. She really impressed me when going back to BTAS. Everyone remembers her for how much of a terrible person she was in Season 2, which is why I was so surprised when she turned into a female Bruce Wayne in Season 3, with her standout episode being Harley's Holiday. Not a great character, but the development that was there made her a background character to be remembered. Anyway, that's it for chemistry. Moving on to Beware the Creeper. Before starting, it's worth mentioning that this is a Joker episode, a very comedic one at that. We just recently got done talking about one of the most epic DCU episodes, a tragic tale about domestic abuse. Since this is a comedic episode, I figured I should warn you beforehand that your mindset going into this episode should be along the lines of Joker's millions as opposed to mad love. So without further ado, beware of the creeper. I really like the setup for this episode, so let's see. His true identity unknown. Operating under a variety of aliases, a nameless Gunsel began his criminal career as a hitman for the Velestra mob. Then he struck out on his own, formed a Come gang. Come on, Bruce. How many times do you have to hear this stuff? First target, the Ace Chemical Plant. Oh, I forgot. 
Mr. Obsessive. That was a neat bit of history, especially with the name drop of the Velestra mob that Joker was once a hitman for. The fact that I don't think Mask of the Phantasm has ever been directly referenced at all in the shows itself before now. Also, the confirmation that the Killing Joke origin story also took place in the DCAU. Joker is here to crash Jack Ryder's show, and honestly, this is one of my favorite Joker scenes. The lines are just great, and Mark Hamill's delivery is superb. Let's show the folks at home what really happened seven years ago. I'll be Batman, you be me. <laughs> what determination! Give that man a cigar. <laughs> Following a pretty slapstick-filled action scene, the Joker gets away and Jack Ryder is drenched in acid. He emerges as a yellow-skinned monster. I'm not sure why he's yellow and Joker turned white, but who cares. The next few minutes are solely spent on Ryder wreaking havoc on the streets of Gotham. I love the store clerk who couldn't care less about this monster in the store. Cash or plastic? With this being Joker's seven-year anniversary, Harley decides to throw him a party. Anniversary, Mr. J. You're really swell and okay. It's seven years to the day. Take the night off. Let's play. Harley, I'm not in the party mood. If you really want to make me happy... Ah! Find the plagiarist who's been stealing my act! That scene really gets a kick out of me, whether it be Harley's crappy singing, the Joker's great setup to throwing her out, or on a more tragic side, remember at the end of Mad Love, she thought Mr. J had redeemed himself, but here she's being thrown out again. Jack Ryder beats the crap out of Joker's goons, but at the same time falls in love with Harley and won't leave her alone. And this is the setup for the episode. Oh, by the way, after being called this by Harley, he decides to name himself the Creeper. I like a girl who plays rough. She just tried to kill you. You're young. You'll learn. And of course, she runs back to Joker as he and the Creeper finally come face to face. You gotta save me putting these after me. And who precisely would that be? Harley! I'm home! Him! <laughs> wow. It does strike fear into the hearts of criminals. He's the Creeper stealing your ass! Once again, I must appreciate the line delivery from all the actors, but also the Creeper's imperviousness creates slapstick that I can't take my eyes off of. With this resulting in Batman and Robin chasing the Creeper in Joker's car, who's chasing Harley and Joker in a giant parade float on the highways of Gotham as Joker is tossing these mannequins on the road to hit the Creeper. While this is no Harley's holiday, the slapstick is still very entertaining. Bye. I couldn't tell you how many times I've rewinded that scene of Joker being tossed off the cliff. In the end, Batman gives the Creeper a cure for his condition that restores him to normal, but the ending hints at him taking off the cure. Looking at it, this episode is very good. I enjoyed the story, the intro was great, lots of memorable moments and slapstick and so on. Not Joker's best appearance this season, and I'd still probably watch many of Joker's classic episodes before this, but regardless, a good time was had. With that said, let us move on. Here we are, the final episode of TNBA and BTAS as a whole. A fan favorite at that. Judgment Day. Despite hyping it up just now, I should let you know this isn't some grand finale or anything. Just an admirable milestone for this retrospective. In the opening, we get another look at the Penguin's underhanded dealings, and I think this scene is probably Penguin's best in the entire series. We see him lowball Croc for $50,000, but that makes a great point. You can take your business elsewhere, but I can't guarantee my level of confidentiality. It is truly a genius system he has. Two-Face was there as well and gets a better deal than Croc. By the way, Croc again has a new voice actor, but it's just so forgettable. Once the deal is done, a new face in the form of The Judge arrives to stop the Penguin, and he instantly is set apart from Batman because of how brutal he is. I need not say more, just look at the clip where The Judge sends a giant penguin towards Cobblepot. I also love the chilling voice and music the judge has accompanying him. The design as well is brilliant. He just seems so lifeless, so ghostly. Simpler tends to be better with these sorts of things, and the judge's design is no exception. It's about time someone threw the book at you. The story from here on out is honestly pretty meh. 
The video has gone on for long enough, so I'm not going to drag it out by telling you what happens in detail. The judge pursues all the usual rogues gallery, and that's what attracts Batman's attention because it's not his place to kill super criminals. One of the local prosecutors is in favor of the judge's extreme violence since that cleans up the street. This results in a great conversation between him and Batman. He's going to kill someone. Who? Two-Face? Killer Croc? You think anyone cares? I always come back to this, and you're probably getting tired of me doing so. But remember what I said in the last season? I said that people must be sick of the same wackos going to Arkham, breaking out, and doing it all over again. This is a full-on confirmation that nobody really cares about the lives and the sanity of Joker or the Mad Hatter. They just want them off the streets, and at this point, the only way to do so would be by killing them. Of course, Batman doesn't believe in that, and this is the struggle for him. The judge goes after Two-Face, but somehow knew about Two-Face's secret escape hatch foreshadowing anyone? Batman steals the judge's gavel from police evidence to look at it, and they find the owner of it via the ward scanner? What the? Seriously, I've never liked these scanner scenes. They're so contrived. Like that tattoo scanner in Read My Lips, or the part with Joker's hair and make him laugh. I don't take too many points off, since this is always just used to get from point A to point B, but still. Throughout the first season of BTAS, we often saw Batman's computer as an AI. That was always strange to me, but I think, computer, were there ever any judge awards passed out, and to whom? Had the computer then check all the databases and got them and find something makes a lot more sense than having a readily available scanner for awards. Batman and the judge have one last fight filled with expensive property damage, and then it's revealed that the judge is actually another side of... Two-Face. This is a pretty iffy plot twist, to be honest. On the one hand, it seems really out of nowhere, but to be fair, it was set up with the scene of Two-Face's HQ, but it just feels unrewarding. I don't know how to describe it though. On the other hand, the twist is that the Harvey Dent side created the judge to fight crime, and there is a precedent for this. Remember Two-Face Part 1, Big Bad Harv was an alternate personality from Harvey, and Two-Face just became the physical manifestation of Big Bad Harv. Also in Second Chance, Harvey was finally getting treatment, but the Two-Face side had set up the foiling of it. In conclusion, Judgment Day was alright. The praise I gave to the first few minutes and the scene between Batman and Prosecutor Corcoran is all I really have for this episode. There were some good action scenes, but the plot became formulaic and the ending was iffy. I can't say I'm with the majority on this one. Regardless, it was fine and probably better than Batgirl Returns or Harley and Ivy, but the best season final still goes to Dreams of Darkness from BTAS V1. And that was Batman the Animated Series Volume 4 aka The New Batman Adventures. I always start these conclusions off with me talking about my expectations and then the reality, so let's discuss. For years on end, I had thought TNBA was by far the worst season of BTAS because of all the usual shenanigans. Joker's design, the female villains look too young, why is there an episode about demons, why an episode about farm folk? This was generally accepted as the quality standard of season 4. I thought this was going to be a much shorter video than even season 2 because of the fact that all of the previous seasons had 28 to 29 episodes and this one only had 24. But during the note-taking process, I quickly realized just how much more I had to say about the 24 episodes we did get in comparison to the previous seasons. I had almost nothing to say about Time Out of Joint, or Avatar, The Forgotten, or The Strange Secret of Bruce Wayne. It was then that I realized that TNBA, once my least favorite season of the entire show, was my favorite. Just looking at it from an analytical standpoint, this season has some real highlights like Old Wounds, Mad Love, Mean Seasons, Joker's Millions, Never Fear, Over the Edge, and so on. In addition to that, from a viewing standpoint, there weren't any episodes that weren't fun to watch. I just binged this season for a straight week and it was done. It was the script that took me so long because there was just that much to say. If you remember, I said season 3 was the best by a large margin. Looking back on this, that season was home to some of the best and most memorable Batman stories of all time, but some really forgettable ones at the same time. So my final verdict is... TNBA is my favorite season of BTAS, with season 3 being a very close second with some admittedly higher highs, but not by much. With that said, that's it for BTAS, well, the show that is. The next Batman video is coming very soon. It'll be a video on Batman Mystery of the Batwoman. But anyway, I gave my thoughts on BTS as a whole in the previous review, so I don't want to waste any time. In conclusion, BTAS is a fantastic series that had a dramatic effect on Batman mythos that you can still feel it to this day. But the massive overlook that's been given to other DCAU shows is really annoying, if I'm honest. Speaking of that overlook, the fact that even this season gets the shaft is just insane. TNBA is all the same things going for it as BTAS and then some. 
This behemoth of a video has definitely shown what I think of BTAS and TNBA though. A special thanks should also go to some of my YouTube compatriots that have appeared in the credits of these videos for helping out with the scripting process, offering different ideas, alternate word choices, different phrases, and so on. A second set of eyes can always be of aid when doing these kinds of things. Just don't ask me, I'm crap when it comes to giving feedback. So in the end, thank you all for watching, especially those who stuck with me throughout this TNBA marathon because it was a tough series of videos to make, but satisfying nonetheless. With that said, I will see you guys next time. She used to look normal, but now all of her skin is white. This is probably just a non-canon design change like Joker or Penguin, however I've always thought that this color change was interesting, especially in combination with the fact that her skin changes to green in the recently released Batman and Harley Quinn. At the end of House and Garden, Ivy was seen flying out of Gotham, sad that her vision of a family would never come true. Her other clones had turned green and died. Maybe this Ivy is just another clone that she left behind to keep Harley entertained. That is a bit of a sad theory to be honest, and definitely worth considering for any lore fans out there. But then again, Ivy cameos a few episodes after House and Garden in Harley's Holiday, maybe I'm just spewing nonsense.